everybody hurts. Ooh, cut that. Damn. <laughs> this is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. guest and we're incompetent at having a guest apparently do we want me to introduce myself <laughs> let's go ahead and do that since since the two of us have decided we are incompetent <laughs> hey brett so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to brett hi brett why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself hey guys i'm brett thanks for having me back <laughs> uh, i'm from the wheel weaves podcast so i run that with well i say i run it but basically my wife runs it and she's a first-time reader, so we do the opposite of what you guys do with spoiler stuff. We do no spoilers. So it's her first read-through, and we go chapter by chapter, pretty much dive into everything about the Wheel of Time. We are currently on the Shadow Rising. We just got to Ruidian, so it's really exciting. And that's what I do. So, yeah, really good part of the books. I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, man. I gotta say, Shadow Rising, still my favorite of the series. Oh, yeah. Oh, the Ruidian yeah. sequence is just the best part of the whole series honestly yeah just, and i gotta say it's pretty ugh. great because the whole nostalgia thing of just watching her get to go through everything for the first time it's really exciting just to like see what she gets totally wrong in predictions and stuff but <laughs> she also gets a lot of stuff like spot on which is kind of weird but that's so awesome yeah i was gonna say are you guys catching up or are we staying about equal in terms of progress well i think there's been a little bit, but not much progress in ca- catching up to you guys. Like, I think when we started, you were maybe three books ahead, I think. Mm. That seems about where we have. Maybe we're about two books ahead now. Yeah, yeah, because we're about halfway through Shadow Rising, kind of, sort of. And, and we're coming to the end of Lord of Chaos. Yeah, so. so two, two and a half. Yeah, so yeah. about exactly the same pacing, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we might we might finish it right about the same time. You may be slightly faster than us. <laughs> The streams will cross around book 12. Thank you for that, yeah. Keith. <laughs> I'm going to go and slash Seth's, Seth's tires or something and make him slow down. So be good. <laughs> Is that how this works? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we're trying to keep with two episodes, two chapters a week is sort of what we have been um, committed ourselves to mm-hmm. now, at least. Well, we do two chapters per episode and then we release six episodes per month. So basically going through about 12 12 chapters a month 12 chapters yeah whereas we are about eight chapters a month yeah so yeah just about so it would make sense that you would catch up with us we'll be on the same book at like the last book at the same time so it'll work (laughs) then maybe we can actually talk spoilers with possibly but i mean that's like seven (laughs) seven years off so Jesus Christ. When, uh, when do you get to tell her Egwene dies? Since like seven <laughs> years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, have to hold that secret. for. There's so many secrets that you're like, honey, I have to hold this in my heart for longer <laughs> than we've, like, known each other. <laughs> well, that's basically what oh, it is, man. too. Yeah. No, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So, I mean, yeah. It's really hard for me to, like, interact in a podcast or in any conversation with people who need spoilers, like, on to need to not get spoiled on things because it's all a wheel and it's all a pool and i don't remember what happens when so it's like i will accidentally almost say stuff or i'll react to things in certain ways and then i have to like make sure to like deliberately obfuscate what i do like a few seconds later just to like introduce chaos and be like nope that didn't mean anything because i just accidentally spoiled that but let me just hide that in this other look over here shiny it's so hard. It's so challenging. I'm so in awe. Yeah, I mean, everything Everything does really blend into the same book. Like, you never really thought, like, I never yeah. had to worry about what happened in which book, right? So. Right. Right. No, and that's the thing, like, we still don't. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. This is a safe yeah. space. You do. <laughs> and that, that, I feel, is, like, one of the big differences, like. Man, that whole that, wait, can I talk about this or can't I? Yeah. So the, the the unfortunately you have Danny there to be like, oh yeah, <laughs> I've seen that or I haven't seen that. You can be like, have you seen the scene where <laughs> these two characters are together? And she's like, no. Well, I mean, that's a thing. Oh, well, even that's kind of a spoiler. Yeah, I, I just I just don't ever confirm or deny anything. Yeah, everything is just yeah neutral. Practicing your poker face. <laughs> Practically, just be you know practicing lying to my wife as much as possible (laughs) it's good 
Excellent skill. Yeah. Excellent yeah. skill. Yeah. Well, it's kind Fantastic. of funny, too, because even for these chapters, when you had sent out the email saying, hey, you know, which chapters would you like to be on? Obviously, you know, tried my best, you know, <laughs> want to get into the one where Rand gets taken and all that. But I thought that this one would be a fun secondary one. And then after you said, yeah, sure, this chapter is good. I went and read it and I was like, oh, shit, we have like first, second, third, fourth string Aes Sedai that I haven't even thought about for <laughs> for like all of eternity. So I had to go back and like <laughs> restudy who everyone is. This is name salad chapter for sure. It, and, and this is a longer one. This yeah. Is, yeah. And so many points of view. And also this is the setup for, in my opinion, the end of the book. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is where he goes to Karian and this is where he, like, that's why he gets taken, right? So this is the... Uh... Well, and Bera and Karuna show up. And Min has, like, the the Dumai's Wells aura gets stronger and loyal returns. It's definitely the setup for all the players you need to go into the boss battle for the book. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and plus, every single Aes Sedai in this chapter swears fealty to Rand at the end of the book, except for the four that don't go. <laughs> like, don't go. They just, they're the ones who go to Saladar after, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wait, Varen swears? Yeah, Varen's well, well, wow. kind of, sort of. She at Dumai's Wells. I'm pretty sure she gets she gets roped into it too. Oh yeah, that's a good question. Doesn't Ver- does Varen swear, or, or does she just compel everyone else to swear, or is she one of the Aes Sedai who gets down on her knees? No, I think she. I is. think she, she gets it. Just doesn't yeah. matter because yeah, she. I mean, and she would too. That's like not even unlikely. It's a very Varen thing to do. Also, it doesn't matter to her because she's dark friend. <laughs> she's sworn to worse people, right? <laughs> Exactly. Like she's like, "Oh, look, a chance to yeah, a chance to get deeper into his trust through the Aiel. This works." <laughs> Did you ever see that movie Yes Man way back in the day with Jim Carrey? Yeah. Where it's just that like was weird. Yeah, so you just have to say yes to everything. So that's Varen's <laughs> entire thing. She just says yes to everything. It's like, "Hey, you want to be a dark friend? <laughs> sure. Why not?" <laughs> want to sweat around? How yeah, sure. Providential. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is chapter 49, The Mirror of the Mists, and our symbol is the son of Kyrian. Obviously, we're in Kyrian. What's the Mirror of the Mists? Oh, oh obviously, the, the... Well, we're in Camelon, the, the actually. Weave. Yeah, we're in Camelon. We right, but we're Kyrian. going to Kyrian. Yeah. Yes, he flees to Kyrian. The Mirror um, of Mists is the Aes Sedai trying to be all big and tall and intimidate Rand. Yeah. Right. So that's their rooster move. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which he's seen. Thank you, Moraine. Yeah, right. At least there and I was like, psh. Rand is like, psh. It's hilarious. You guys hear Timber going all nuts in the background? Yeah. A little bit. That's okay. Timber. He's, he, got, he got taken for a walk while I started this. So oh, happy got boy. Back. Rand puffed contentedly on his pipe, sitting in his shirt sleeves with his back against one of the slender white columns that surrounded the small oval courtyard and watched the water spray up the marble fountain, sparkling like gems in sunlight. The morning still left part of the courtyard in pleasant shade. Even Louis Theron was still. Are you sure you won't reconsider Tyr? Seated against the next column, and also coatless, Perrin blew two smoke rings before replacing his pipe, a rather ornate thing carved with wolf heads. What about what Min saw? Rand's attempt at his own ring ran afoul of a sour grunt and came out just a puff of smoke. Min had no right to bring that up where Perrin could hear. Do you really want to be tied to my belt, Perrin? What I want hasn't seemed to count much since the first time we saw Moraine back in Emmons Field, Perrin said dryly. He sighed. You are who you are, Rand. If you fail, everything fails. Suddenly he sat forward, frowning towards the wide doorway behind the columns to the left. A long moment later, Rand heard footsteps in that direction, too heavy for any human. The broad shape that ducked through the doorway and strode into the courtyard was more than twice as tall as the serving woman, who was almost running to keep up with the Ogier's long legs. Loyal! Loyal! Loyal. Yeah, he's made it. The return of Loyal. (laughs) So good. (laughs) Yeah, I missed him almost more than I missed Perrin in the last book. Right? He's so helpful. He's so good and wholesome and grounded. Excellent. Loyal is just like pinnacle too good for everybody in this series. So pure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And not broody. Yes, Lumen. (laughs) And the avatar of Robert Jordan, in my opinion. Totally. No, I mean, that makes sense. The big pockets bulge with square shapes. Mm-hmm. He literally writes the books. <laughs> right, that's the whole thing. Like, at the end, you get these loyal son of Arendt from the Fourth Age writing the book of the Dragon Reborn. Um, so in that read-in, obviously, 
we get Rand trying to pester Perrin into going to Tyr, which we talked about a lot. Yeah. And then what about what Min saw, which was the prophecy that Perrin needed to be close to Rand? Twice. Or else something bad will happen. Or maybe something bad will happen, but it won't be as bad because Perrin will be there. Or, like, she doesn't know. But twice he has to be there or else everything is lost. And I think that that's Dumais Wells and killing Lanfear. Yeah, that would make sense because that's, like, Perrin's most critical roles with Rand in the series. Like, those are the two things where things go bad if he's not there. I would disagree. I think the second one isn't Lanfear. I think it's Veins of Gold. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, he does yell to Rand from the dream. But, I mean, you could also counter with him bringing the wolves in the dream to defend Shale Ghoul is just as critical. Yeah, he does hold the line there. Yeah. And he brings in the, the dream spike. So my argument uh, is that the reason is because the th something bad happening is him turning to the dark side. And that doesn't necessarily... With Lanfear, I don't think that would have happened. She would have just killed Rand. Whereas with Veins of Gold, I think if Perrin hadn't been there to protect him, and he'd been attacked, he would have turned to the dark but side. he wasn't attacked by any... My, Perrin didn't defend him from anything during Veins of Gold. Slayer. Slayer wasn't trying to get to Rand. Am I mixing things up? Totally possible. Yeah, no. Uh, Perrin is in the dream for some other reason and then gets drawn to Dragon Mount. But there's nobody attacking Rand for that. But Slayer is very much attacking Rand during the last battle to tell Iron Riyadh. And Perrin uses all of his Sanderson level ups to completely, you know, <laughs> right. Gandalf, right. you shall not pass. That situation. Got a couple of I am. I'm, to I'm confl conflating those two scenes. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, it's a reasonable mix-up to make. I mean, third option, maybe Min was wrong, and there's three times Perrin saves him. So, I don't know. <laughs> there's two, and three, and four, and five. Uh, I mean, two yeah. is yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. but there's a whole bunch more as well. Yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah, I think but Dumai's Wells has to be one of them. For sure. No one's yeah. arguing that. Yeah. Like, and so then what does Dumai's Wells have in common with the other options? Like, it's times when he could literally have been killed, right? Not turned. He wasn't in danger of being turned, with Demise Wells. He was in danger of being, like, killed. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the Swan and Bryn situation, right? So you have to stay close to each other two times or forever or whatever it was. And they thought they had it, and then... Yeah, for them it was forever. So it's a little bit of a different situation, but it's a similarity in the closeness, like proximity situation, so... Hmm. There's a lot of times that Perrin completely saves Rance Bacon. <laughs> yeah, no, everyone's like, just two? <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's yeah that 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 seems to be the wrong part of the prophecy is like <laughs> yeah we knew it was going to be a bunch but like why two like it seems like 20 should be a more accurate foretelling yeah just constant so we see him say basically you are who you are if you fail everything fails what i want is irrelevant because you matter unless Fayil gets stolen by shido in which case fuck off Right, well, in that case, he's willing to let everything fail to save her. Mm -hmm. Because that's a great way to save your wife, is to let the world burn around her. I, it's, you know, not the best logic. Yeah. I mean, Perrin's a little hypocritical, too, because in this page, he's saying, you know, you are who you are, and you have to do whatever you have to do, because if you fail, we all die and lose. But then, two pages later, he gets mad at Ran for trying to use Loyal to search out Waygates. So, pick a side here. Yeah. Like, is it Ran has to do whatever he has to do, or is it <laughs> don't use people? Yeah, that's a good point. He's very inconsistent on how he expects Rand to behave. Gosh, it's almost like people are occasionally irrational and hold two conflicting thoughts in their head <laughs> at the same time. That is so fantastical and illogical. My disbelief has been completely unsuspended. Well, yeah, judging somebody for something you do yourself is very human. But yeah, this is a lot of, of Rand trying to make things happen that are not going to happen at all. This is so many plans that Rand has pointed at that just completely go by the wayside. And so it doesn't really matter what the details are. And I mean, is that pattern pushing him in the right direction because he has to get captured because it's part of, you know, everything that happens? Or it's really hard to tell what's up to the pattern and what's just everyone pushing back against Rand. I'm nodding. I mean, but everything's the pattern, right? That's the whole point, right? So you can't separate. Yeah, the yeah. Pattern pats is the pat pats. That's the perfect. <laughs> yes. Well, it had to be that way, right? <laughs> Yeah, but it's. I feel like it's an le object lesson in Rand trying to take control versus letting Taviran do its work, right? He puts so much effort into doing this. and That's true. You can't sit around and do nothing. 
But he's pushing at the wrong things, right? He's being a stubborn woolhead and not utilizing his allies correctly. So, of course, he's pushing water uphill in a sieve. Mm -hmm. You also have to go with what the pattern wants, right? If the pattern wants you to be the Dragon Reborn, you can't resist that or else it's going to slap you back into line. Mm -hmm. I notice here that Perrin, we see his increased senses from Rand's point of view. Yeah, a long moment. Yeah, like noticeable. Suddenly he sat forward. Yeah. Yeah. He hears men coming. Or loyal, he hears loyal coming first, and then in coming long before long before anyone else is able to sense uh, incoming. Yeah. And so, yeah, he sits up, and we see loyal coming in, and we love loyal. Yeah, everyone loves loyal. It's it's a delightful reunion to know that he got a bit of a reboost at the steading, and he's feeling good, and he's got plenty of distance between him and his mother. And oh, Aerith, wait, how much distance was that again? So cute! Oh my god, loyal, so cute. Also, what he thinks is going to happen when he gets married, and what actually happens when he gets married, is he has all these, like, oh my god, it's going to be awful, it's going to be terrible, and then he gets married, and she's, like, his ally and standing up for him, and I'm like, damn straight, that's what a marriage is. Yeah. Right? And it's so silly, because he's like, she listens so well, and she's so smart. Being married to her would be great, aside from marriage is horrible. It's like, don't you think she might be as much of a rebel as you, if you like her that much? Don't think she? Don't you think she might stand up for you? I mean, I kind of get where Loyal's coming from. He's... I mean, he's in this, like, weird, almost arranged marriage situation, too. So I understand, the, like, the hesitance if you grew up in, you know, the steadings with people getting into these forced... Maybe forced isn't the best word, but, you know, arranged marriages where your mother marries you off. Yeah. So I can see where he might see some, you know, issues with that because he wants to go adventure and you don't really know Aerith very much, so... Yeah, but he's also, like, completely besotted with her. Oh, yeah. So, it's like, come on, dude, give her some credit. I don't know, have you seen her ears? They're pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> Loyal's status in society, his mother is one of the top speakers. His mentor is one of the top elders. And mm. he is one of the only and best tree singers in any of the steadings. Like, you talk about status, he's basically an Ogier prince never thought of that so is there like performance anxiety here yeah i mean <laughs> but like in a series like is he worried about living up to the name of these great people when he's just loyal who wants to write books exactly i, th I think he's more interested in writing his books and all these like great things the speaker the, being a great speaker like that that is the pressure that he's not really up for and it's only circumstances that force him to speak for the world and it turns out he's talented because of course he is because he's loyal yeah, I kind of equate it to, like, your mom's a lawyer and your dad's a doctor and then you're pushed into one of those, but you actually just want to be an author. Exactly. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you go and run away. <laughs> right. Yeah, run away and go, like, join, you know, the Merry Pranksters or something. <laughs> and while you're out country. there, like, happen to meet up with the king, the, the guy who's going to become king. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Chat's pointing out also that his mentor is technically his uncle. Elder Hammond is married to his mom's sister or something like that so yeah he's definitely a little bit under expectations <laughs> keith says loyal will be a doctor a lawyer or a failure <laughs> <laughs> oh that's so brutal imperfect scorecards are like a shame on your family kind right of thing. Yeah. yeah 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 a why not a plus <laughs> right <laughs> sounds like the inside of my head <laughs> fool of life says that he's mulan you know, I'm okay with this, honestly. <laughs> Loyal as Oh, lot. man. That works a little too well. Yeah. And then Aerith comes along and is like another Mulan and it's just wonderful. Except not. Aerith is more like, what's his face? The love interest. He has a dragon sidekick, just like Mulan. Oh my god! Wow. This was <laughs> somebody make this into a meme series, please. So we need the, uh, <laughs> the Be A Man song? Be No Gear? We need a recap. Hey, that's something you could actually write for the Dusty Wheel. Yeah. Yeah, someone can have oh. an idea for the Dusty Wheel. That's free. Oh, that's great. Right. Yeah, you take that make it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Lou, and Rand would be a lot happier being Mushu. Rand would love to be a third tier sidekick. That would be Rand's happy place. Just playing his flute and being silly. So I love the friendship between uh, Loyal and Gaul. Gaul corrupted him. He dices now and bets on horse races when he can barely tell one horse from another. <laughs> yeah. But just because the relationship between Aiel and Ogier goes back to the Age of Legends, 
And seeing that be rebuilt through Gaul and Loyal is one of those things that really makes me happy. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, yeah, the Aiel come to Steading sometimes. Like, that's, they've never had an issue. And so, yeah, they just kind of like, yeah, that's nice. And you hardly ever see it on screen. But they've been through a lot in Perrin's Shadow together. And, I mean, that's something that wouldn't happen in a Steading either. Not going to be able to go gambling with your Aiel buddies. <laughs> no. <laughs> His mother Stop. would say no. Although, you know, Ogier seemed to play a version of dice that is far more advanced than what humans do. That's true. So, because Much higher he, math. Way back when, like, Faldara. So they don't gamble money, but they play dice. Yeah, well, I was going to say the Shine Arns <laughs> wouldn't dice with Loyal, like, back in book two or something. They refused oh, yeah. because they were like, no, 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 you're a builder. But it's also because Loyal is probably really good at dice and math and games of gambling in, in a sense. So mm-hmm. Loyal's the right kind of nerd to be really good at gambling. Yeah. To like understand odds and bets and what card's going to come up next. Also counting cards. He's... I can see Loyal being like ridiculously mm-hmm. good at that. Mm-hmm. He's the one who gets dragged to the back room of the casino. Yeah, an an intuitive understanding of statistics and an innate ability to remember things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We count the cards without knowing it was wrong. Exactly, Lumen. Yeah. (laughs) And then, like, admit it and be like, I was just counting everything. Be like, what, isn't that how the game is played? You count the cards? (laughs) Isn't that the game? (laughs) You can't count them, and then they, like, lay out a sequence of, like, 30 cards, and he repeats them back flawlessly. And he's like, what Mm -hmm. is that exactly what you count card when you play cards <laughs> you keep track of the cards that's what what would make sense to me very much i love i love doing a loyal voice <laughs> i got michael kramer and kate redding if i love them for nothing else it's for giving us the ogier loyal voice to then oh, yeah. play with Definitely. yeah yeah well it's like a voice that you couldn't really pull out for a typical character right like who else would fit that the low slow speech pattern like there's not many characters you could do that for. Lumen is saying Kate Redding does a great pattern in Stormlight. And I agree. Like, almost on the opposite end, whereas, like, one is low and slow and emotional, she's able to do this high, almost emotionless, and yet entertaining voice for pattern. This, like, clueless... I don't, I don't know. It's it's very, very good. Brady, I know you haven't done Stormlight. Nope, I have not. Brett, have you? I am currently doing a Cosmere read through so i read recently so i finished the both mistborn trilogies all the secret histories and then i did broken earth and then i did uh, i read elantris and then i read i'm in the middle of warbreaker and then i'm moving on to stormlight so it's like in the runnings we're really close we're getting there um but you so but you've listened to the audiobooks by michael kramer and kate redding or do you read oh yeah yeah yep audiobook yeah audiobooks for all the wheel of time i've read at least i've listened at least once through all of them so what do you think about Loyal's exposure to Steading? Does he need more? Was this break enough? I honestly think he's good. Yeah? I think he topped up, yeah. Or do you think he's doing a rant and hiding his pain? It's it's a weird situation. It's, I, I, think it's, I think it's like for a typical Ogier who doesn't want to be... It's a homesickness thing, like to, taken to an extreme where if you long to go home you have to go home and you can only spend a week away or whatever it might be. But for loyal, he doesn't want to be there. So his like recharge time I feel would be a lot quicker because he doesn't have the longing of wanting to go home because home is wherever, you know, the story is going to take him. So I don't think that he's in any danger. I I never really got that. I think he's in danger, but I think he tops up by going to the studying now and then. Like, I think he's definitely going to need a decade or two to like stay at home and not go out once it's all over but i really if only he had novel to write or something right but i i really like what you're saying brett that like the fact that for him home is where the story is i think that does help sustain him through these weird end times but i think he needed to go to the studying for a bit and just to top up a little bit that and that's fair too that's fair too he's for sure like at some point gonna need to go and settle down a little bit but for now, he's young, he's energetic. It's kind of like going out drinking when you're 21, right? <laughs> you could go for <laughs> four nights in a row, and now a decade later, you have three-day hangovers. So it's it's a little bit different, but... It's been two decades later. <laughs> <laughs> two decades so. later. Uh, yeah, and it, it doesn't get any better. Like, oh, the 40s are... You get out of shape, and you feel terrible. And I'm like, well, 
to also stop moving. Yeah. So well, I I started this crazy new happens. thing this year for New Year's resolutions was uh, drinking water. Whoa. And like, not even a, a sarcastic joke here. No, like I'm a guy who I would not drink water. Like I get my water from, you know, whatever it might be. But right. I started drinking like three or four liters of water a day and it's fixed a lot of problems like heartburn and like you feel better and got more energy. It's crazy. So Water's drink amazing. water, guys. Yeah. Public service announcement. Yeah. It's weird. I don't know. <laughs> Public service. Yeah. Apparently you need it to live. Travis likes to drink Coke um, and he gets the glass bottle of Coke. Okay. But not, not, not often. He drinks like one every couple of days. Right, fine. But what we've been doing is we save those glass bottles, refill them with water, throw them back in the fridge. And so we keep is like a 12-pack of Coke, glass Coke bottles of water in the fridge. And then instead of grabbing a soda, I just grab that. And it kind of feels like I'm grabbing a soda because the glass is mm-hmm. the same and it's cold. But it's just water. Nice. <laughs> And that's really helped us, helped me at least, uh, consume a lot more water. That and I'm drinking a shit ton of tea these days, just because it's cold. Mm. And, like, hot yeah, water yeah. is, hot, hot leaf water is better than cold water. That's fact. <laughs> yeah, that's where it's at, though. Moraine will agree with you on that one. Tea is where it's at. <laughs> so would Varen. Mm, gotta be careful what kind of tea you <laughs> hanging out with Varen. <laughs> it's too soon, too soon for that. <laughs> You first, Varen. Go ahead. Have a sip. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing I I have is some very humorous statements from Royal about Perrin and Fael and <laughs> uh, relationships in general. Yeah. Oh, you can smile, Perrin. Fael does whatever you say. <laughs> Perrin choking on his pipe, wheezing until Rand slapped his back. <laughs> yeah. Has... Lois Loyal was there for the whole, like... The ways incident. Yeah, right? he, he never totally understood was. that though. He didn't actually get it. He he never really grasped the concept of what was happening there. No, and parents sitting over there having recently had that really awkward conversation with the elder Bashirs and Fayil being like, "I'm so meek. Look at me," and he's just like, "Yeah, I can see why he's choking on his pipe at this point." <laughs> <laughs> and then he does a double take and is like, "Wait." Era. Yeah, right? He's that. like, this is going like, to be horrible, Ooh. horrible. Wait, what? Hmm? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> so cute. Yeah, at which point I feel like he's just like, cute and liked my... But, and she put up with my bullshit. Yeah, and basically he's nice. impressed with her <laughs> intelligence because she listened to him. And I'm just like, okay, so pro tip, that's not necessarily what you think it is. In this case, it is, actually. <laughs> Aerith is obviously super into him, and they do have proper back-and-forth conversations. But it's just, like, just because she listens to you doesn't mean that she's into you. So then Rand thinks about sending Loyal to go communicate with the elders of Steading about Waygates. He's also sort of doing something with Loyal that he did with Sulin, which is give them a task, but also give them what they need. Sulin needed to be, quote-unquote, shamed, right? She needed... To fulfill her toe by gaining G. And so sure. he gave her a place under him. What he's doing is giving Loyal a duty to go close all the wave gates, but he basically is going to take him to steading after steading after steading after steading. And so if he is in any way in danger and not admitting it, well, he's literally going between steadings. He can stay in one until they gateway to the next. Huh, I hadn't thought of that. Okay, that's actually a good point. Hmm. And so here he says, if Loyal's mother and Elder Hamun were believed, the steading were what Loyal needed. Uh-huh. Of course, he could not take Loyal any closer than the edge of one. You cannot channel into a steading any more than you can channel inside one. But he can take, give Loyal a channeler and literally have him gateway between steadings. And so no matter how long he's been out, essentially what he's doing is listening to Elder Hamun and his mother and saying, Loyal, uh-huh. go get better. I'm worried about you. Man, he should say that to himself. He's trying to get everybody to be happy and get what they want. And, I mean, that's not something that Rand does that often. <laughs> True. Like, he's playing all sides of the board here. You look at what Perrin says. And Perrin's like, how dare you fucking use him? You know, he just showed up. While, you know, you know, you're just driving to the edge. And it's like, no, he's giving him exactly what he needs to survive. Yeah. He's helping him. Yeah. Yeah. Wake up, Perrin. You're not <laughs> seeing what's going on here. Perrin, Perrin. <laughs> Perrin, 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 Perrin. 
But yeah, it is this front that, that Rand, instead of saying, I'm going to help him, he is saying, like, I have to use them. Like, you know, he's repeating this thing in his own head. I have to use him. I have to, like, you know, I'm doing this terrible thing to him. And it's like, oh, if I look at what he's actually doing, what he's doing is giving giving me, giving Loyal exactly needs. And also, like, he really needs an Ogier to do this task. Like, nobody else will make it work. It makes a lot of sense that, like, the Loyal who showed you the ways, who guided you, you the through them for the first time who locked the first one you ever went to like this is the person you trust and you want to go solve this problem for you i mean i think that's a big point too just the fact that there are very few people that rand will like implicitly trust and loyal is definitely one of those people because he's been with them for the longest out of almost everybody so there's that trust factor too to guarding the ways and we've seen that in the last few chapters. Rand has delegated almost all the important things. This is sort of it's it Shadow Logoth moment in the books where everyone disperses to what they're going to be doing pretty much for the rest of the series. Yeah. From this point. Mm-hmm. Everyone comes to Rand and he sends Matt off to get uh, Elaine back. He sends Perrin off. Well, slightly after this, but he sends Perrin off. Basically, this is sort of a dispersal point, dispersion point. for. Yeah, and, and a lot of these people, he doesn't... He actually keeps with him until after Doom Eyes Wells and then sends them out at the beginning of the next book. But, yeah. But the plans are yeah. in place, just because Doom Eyes Wells kind of interrupts that. But, like, he's planning on sending them out. Very much so. And everyone just keeps coming to Rand being like, you need to use me. I don't know how. That's for you to know and me to find out. Yeah, and, and part of me agrees. This is a point where Jordan probably thought he had three books left in the series. Uh-huh. Yeah. For sure. (laughs) And was starting to set up the end. Yeah, and then the slog is when he was, like, adjusting speeds, basically. Gear shifting down and being like, okay, wait, I got more time. In that case, let me go run around with this minor POV and get distracted with that. (laughs) I also think he had more, he realized he had more lanes to set Mm -hmm. up. Like, he hadn't set up everything that he wanted, and, like, he needed to delay a few things while he set up a few other things yeah catch up the timelines and all that stuff i can kind of see robert jordan like having an internal battle with himself every day being like i need to get this series done no i need to tell it correctly Mm -hmm. no i have to like finish faster don't do it you'll ruin the characters it's like just an internal struggle back and forth between himself you know part of me I i hate to bring this up but part of me wonders what he was thinking when he realized that he was dying and he wasn't gonna be able to finish it himself Oh, I know, right? That's just, yeah. You know, did he regret that? Was he, you know, was he happy that he hadn't was close enough that there were notes? Like, I, you know, I, that's one of those things that I, I could never ask Harriet, but I would love to hear her uh, talk about the state of his mind at the end. And and I don't think she ever will. And I mean, in so many ways, and it's it's such a sensitive topic, obviously, to, to talk about being not a person who was not even remotely in in the picture, right? But it wasn't a instantaneous you know passed away in his sleep situation where it's like oh shit what do we do at the end of the book series it was a slow burn where he discussed what he wanted and they talked and there was conversation about how do we end this series right i'm so glad that he let it get finished and 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 my understanding is he was very focused on the work right like he wanted to produce the best thing he possibly could and that was his priority and like god love the man you know, I mean, that. and it's your, yeah, it's your life's work, right? You don't want to, you don't want to end it quickly just to get it done. Like, this is the pinnacle. And, you know, we all have a plan until all of a sudden they get cut. What's it that they say in this? Uh, plans last until first contact with the enemy because we're ripping off ancient battle tactics written in Proverbs. It was Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson said everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. That's exactly what I was thinking, yeah. It, it's probably a Marcus Aurelius quote also, like, honestly. <laughs> I don't know. I'm pretty sure Ben Franklin said that. I don't know. Mike Tyson, he was a bit of a philosopher. <laughs> so we get a second instance of somebody, of Perrin, looking long before anyone shows up. So Rand has clearly noticed Perrin's abilities from, you know, Perrin's always like, I'm hiding it so well. And then you get from anyone's <laughs> point of view and they're like, that that dude can sense shit. Wolfy dude shit. over like, there. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> Look at his wolf eyes and his wolf nose and his wolf eyes. And parents like, I'm being subtle. And okay, I like, got I got to throw this out here too. So if you had a best buddy who was like getting yellow eyes, could clearly have some you know extra abilities. The first thing I would do would be like, Hey man, 
Do you have superpowers? What are your superpowers? What can you do? Right? And, like, Rand's a channeler. I can't imagine not, like, telling my best friend what I can do. Be like, hey, man, I got superpowers, by the way. I don't know if you noticed, but it's pretty freaking awesome. It's just crazy that they never talk to each other in detail and just, like, level with each other about the superpowers. And I get it that it's, like, all terrible and whatnot, but... I think it's different. They're, we think of them as superpowers. They think of them as personal shames. I and that's the word, and I hate it so. Much. <laughs> I just hate yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the coolest thing ever, <laughs> and then let me hate it. <sighs> you can bend the elements to your will. Oh, that's something to be afraid, of, like shamed of. Like, no, that's not how we do things here. Rand is being told he's a literal incarnation of the devil reborn, and Perrin is being told he is animal filthy even when you say it like that it sounds cool <laughs> you read too much fiction man i'm just gonna say that <laughs> yeah these guys were reading the travels of jane no, I know, I know. and that was about it so no like i i get it i get it but it's just it's also like a piece of me just it hurts inside yeah i agree with that who comes running in of course min min being awesome and min is in a tizzy because she's got these seven eyes that i showing up Manipulated very efficiently by Baron, by the uh -huh. way, to show up and confront Rand about... Stabbing Demira. Something. Yeah. Which Rand has no idea because he... Yeah, Rand and Min don't know, yeah. but it was stabbing Demira. <laughs> which, as we know, was not done by Aiel and not done by anyone under Rand's command. Yeah, it was White Cloaks, right? No, it was done by Dark... White Cloaks. And it wasn't Dark Friends. So why did Varen manipulate them into being stupid about that? If she didn't orchestrate the attack, then why would she manipulate them into this stupid confrontation? I mean, opportunity. I think it's her actually being a dark friend. No, I was just going to say, like, this is the pinnacle point where them putting pressure on Rand to lift the restrictions and then the extra Aes Sedai coming in and Varen being all in the know about things because she's just like that leads Rand to fleeing to Kyrian, which kind of sets in place the rest of the book. So it's hard to say exactly what Varen is in on. I, I have a really hard time following why. Why Demir got stabbed and why Varen undercut Marana. So my conclusion about getting stabbed is that was actually just Fane being fucking nuts, adding some chaos, right? He sent his... I mean, this this book is Lord of Chaos, so it makes sense. Lord of Chaos, Yeah. Uh, man, Fane works really well for the Lord of Chaos, but Fane sent some of his White Cloaks in to the Aes Sedai to say, stay away from him, he's mine. Because Fane is nuts and thinks Rand is his. I really think that what Jordan is making, the point that, like, Chaos leads people to make decisions that lead them into dangerous situations that lead to big consequences. Like, I think we're kind of looking at butterfly effect here. Okay, and so then why is Varen advising this nonsense and undercutting Marana? Well, I think Varen's just being a dark friend. I think that this is one of those situations where she's under orders to just fuck with shit and keep Rand away from the tower whenever possible. Well, I mean, that's kind of Varen Zambo is that she's the yes man of say yes to the situation. And it's not like she necessarily told like Bera and Karuna to, I don't know what the word is, to undermine Marana, but she goes with it really well. She sees Bera and Karuna coming in and like looking down on the leader of this embassy and wanting to step in. So why wouldn't she just, like, go with it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, she has to maintain her cover until the correct moment to blow it. So creating yeah. chaos is easy and her ammo. And yeah, as long as she's slowing down Rand making an alliance with any eyes to die, she's fulfilling her personal motivations and her dark friend motivations. Let the Lord of Chaos rule. I firmly believe Varen is under orders to let the Lord of Chaos rule. And she knows that phrase. Yeah, I agree. Varen's never really been, like, the person who gets really dirty in the situations. Like, she likes to be there and observe, but she's not, though, necessarily overtly pulling strings. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's very behind the scenes, very subtle, very observy. Observy is a new word, so, yeah. <laughs> but I think in the reveal that she is a dark friend and that only in the hour of her death is she able to betray the dark one. She's not a good actor. I think that her, you know, when we say, why is she doing this? And, and you ask me why, I got to say, for the dark one, to make things bad for Rand. She is a dark friend acting with dark friend motivations. And yes, she is limiting that because she has personal motivations that 
make her not a dark friend, obviously, but she still has to obey orders. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, if she doesn't have explicit orders to do things just to run with it, then that kind of lines up with what what's happening here. She's just going with what's happening. That too, yeah. Yeah. No, she's always, she's more than happy to give it a little push, but... Yeah, like she'll nudge, but she's, like, she's not the one who's taking over the embassy, right? No, she's just making so. sure the embassy falls apart. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's the undermining right. part. So. Vera and Karuna take over the embassy because Marana's been so undercut. <laughs> she is, yeah, Varen. she's having a bad time. <laughs> and it gets worse oh, but... poor Marana. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah min comes running in freaking out and ranch just goes all like icy calm and it's like is this the day that i get tortured and beaten by Aes Sedai? do you think that would be inconvenient yeah that's next She's week like, i don't know <laughs> woolhead <laughs> that's next week <laughs> yeah <laughs> pretty much literally yeah so min has noted that Demira has taken to her bed, and that's to recover from the uh, stabby, stabby. exhaustion of being healed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, I mean, she's been healed, so she doesn't need to recover from the stabbing necessarily. But she had to sleep. But she had to yeah. rest. And that's his only clue. He, she's like, I have no idea why. So that's also, you know, she ha- doesn't know about any of what's going on with the stabbiness. Yeah, Min and Rand's ignorance here really uh, does not do them any favors. <laughs> they, they both can cl- spin themselves up into concluding the wrong things. Because they don't know what's what. Min's entire sequence in this is so, so unusual. Like, Min's got a weird role to play in this, like, back and forth. Yeah. She's sort of trusted by both parties, yeah. It, it's it's a weird situation. Like, she's really stuck in the middle of, of everybody here. And probably the only person who really knows, is I was going to say, is, is, like, Varen. Like, possibly of, of Min's actual allegiance. But that's, like, a big question mark, too. So Rand learns that seven are coming, and he freaks the fuck out, because he knows he can handle six by himself, but seven seems to be too many, no matter how weak they are. So I have to freak LTT out. <laughs> but he does have the little fat man on Rial, which is sort of his little weapon. In his green room. Yes. If he can get to his green room first. Now that one has got an interesting history. So it gets he loses it during the kidnapping, and he doesn't have it again for quite some time. He does, in Sanderson's writing, recover it from the White Tower. Yeah. I wasn't really sure. It seems to be an off-screen, maybe a bit of a stretch. Like, he just wanted him to have it again. Because, like, I thought it was lost in Dumai's Wells. Yeah, but then doesn't he, like, pull out a coat at one point? And it's, like, the one he wore home from Dumai's Wells and hasn't worn since, and that's where it was the whole time? Is that like finding a 20 in your pocket? Like, dude, Basically. sweet. Pretty good feeling. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot about the song Real that I had. Yeah, it's more like finding a loaded gun than a twenty dollar bill, but yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he loses it for a while as a result of Do My Wells, and yeah, I was never quite sure about how it got reinserted into the story. Like, wouldn't having it just be lost have made more sense? But yeah, he feels more confident with that. So he basically tells the Aiel maiden he tells the maidens like Help me look badass. Right, help me get ready. And then he has this hilarious back and forth with Jelani, where he's like... I love this. Okay, so there's no time to waste, so I need you to go tell Mandera I'm doing this thing. She's like, that's been done. Like, okay, well then tell Sulem to go do this other thing. She's like, that's been done too. And she's (laughs) clearly feeling very, like, self-righteous and full of herself because she's 17 and has already done everything. Yeah. And then he's like... In that case, you can bring my horse to the Grand Hall. It's and so she's good. Like, what? What? <laughs> and it's just the humor. <laughs> That's a power move is what that is. And there's something mm-hmm. about bringing like a horse to the middle of a palace that's just like uh, the most absurd, especially with an Aiel who doesn't even think horses are a thing. You know, I, a part of me really wanted Rand to just like be on the horse for when they walk in just in the middle of the hall. <laughs> <laughs> just like all casual. <laughs> That would have been awesome. Just, it's just instead of on the throne, just yeah. in front of the throne on his horse. Yeah, it's just like, hey, yeah, I hang out on my horse sometimes in the throne room. It's all good. <laughs> I, I do that. You know, that's just what what you do. I remember when when Min shows up, uh, and recently, and she goes to the maidens, and they're like, you know, well, if he doesn't want to see you, then that's not going to go well for you. But you can come in. She's like, well, I don't think he wants to see my horse. And there's that whole awkward moment. This kind of reminds me of that. 
Like, the Aiel do not get horse-based humor. They just really don't. Or wait, no, they do get her joke. They get her joke. They don't get this joke. Okay, they get some horse-based humor. It kind of reminds me of the Old Spice, I'm on a horse. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's the power pose, right? That's what it is. I mean, that's that's what Rand wants when these I said I walk in, is he wants to be the arrogant, I mean, in a good way, but... But this is one of those Rand Aiel interactions that's actually it's it's one of those situations that like Jordan writes really good hypocritical humor, but he also writes this sort of really good like I don't want to call it boss employee humor, but this like hey I know you're working for me, but like we're all kind of stuck in this together. Let's have fun. I'm gonna fuck with you. You're gonna fuck with me. And it's like it, it's a very wholesome family dynamic that's sort of happening in the background that i really like and that he writes really well um and that i kind of like yeah yeah it's family energy exactly for sure yeah but it's the cast rather than a biological unit exactly yeah it's like you're captain of the ship but we're all in the same ship together so right yeah robert jordan does a good job of bringing that across and yet in a subtle way where it's not banging you over the head Right, right. It actually just sort of emerges. It's an emergent property of the characters rather than something that he spells out. And this is where I love his characters. You know, I, I can go all day about how much he writes characters that come to life for me. And and however he does that, it's it's through stuff like this. Little joke between the Aiel and Rand that give them both such life. So I, I once again want him to mention that he compares Min to Elaine and Avienda. Mm-hmm. Is he still in denial? That's a girl who likes me move. Uh-huh. She's manipulating mm. me. I don't like that. <laughs> Why does that feel so familiar? Mm. And then she totally doesn't obey either. No, of course not. No, well, not at all. Because, like, immediately Fayo comes and takes Perrin away, and then Loyal just cannot stand up to Min, and she sneaks in and hears everything that happens in the subsequent scene. Right. She can't quite see anything. It wasn't. Is it that the illusions obscure everything, or is it that... Yeah. Yeah, it's the illusions. Yeah. Well, it's both. She didn't have a good line of sight, and the fact that they were channeling would have blurred the images anyway. But yeah, Rand goes ski-daddling off to look imposing ahead of the Aes Sedai. I'm not running, as he runs. Uh, the next thing I have is the Aes Sedai walking in the doorway. Is he, He's in the, in the throne room, and the Aes Sedai walk in. Yeah, he's been in the throne room for all of, like, 0.2 seconds. The Aiel just got into position, and then it's like, everything's perfect, bam, the Aiel walk, or the Aes Sedai walk in. Yeah, it was good timing. It's like he's still kind of breathing hard. Uh huh. Uh huh. And then you do the thing where you're like trying to like make sure your chest doesn't actually move, like while you like also like your lungs are just going. <laughs> and then you're like hyperventilating because you can't breathe and don't want to breathe fast. Totally get that. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. it's like when you walk upstairs and you're like, oh my god, why am I out of breath? No, act like this is normal. <laughs> yeah, this is fine. This is totally fine. I meant for this to happen. It kind of reminds me when you're. Uh parents come in and when you were a kid and you pretended to be asleep because you didn't really want them to like interact with you but you were totally awake <laughs> and they knew you were awake so you control your breathing <laughs> but you're like trying to control your breathing and like like close your eyes and it's like your mom's like okay honey good night <laughs> pat you on the head yeah. i feel like that's the way i said ir is like okay you clearly although he did fool them a little bit clearly they they looked a little startled but it, this is a very pageantry heavy interaction uh-huh it's a lot of theatrics on both parts. So there's a good bit of uh, sort of figuring it out as they go along choreography of grandiosity that's very um, odd. So I, I just want to get your guys' opinion on this too. Do you think that this is a good move by the Aes Sedai or a bad move? Like the whole storm in unannounced, tell them to revoke all the restrictions. Good move? Not good move? I don't think it would be a good move even if they were right about him ordering the stabbing. I'm nodding. This is the worst move they could make. It would be, like, even worse if he did order the stab, and because then they're walking into the line <laughs> den here of the guy who just tried to almost kill one of them. Yeah, the arrogance to be like, well, we're going to tell you not to. It's like when someone says, well, I have the information that would implicate you, so you're definitely going to jail, and then they're surprised when they get murdered in the next scene. Yeah, it's like, like, why are you maybe saying don't that? don't gloat. <laughs> So it's, yeah, I agree. This is the worst move, completely boneheaded, Lord of Chaos fingerprints all over this plan. But again, is this is this Varen influencing, what was it, Demira? Because this is Demira's plan, is it not? Because Varen said you can choose. Yeah, it is. It is. 
Well, this and this is the thing. It's it's Varen telling Demira, hey, since you got stabbed, you can decide how you're going to punish yes, Ram. Yes, that's what it is. It's so yeah, bad. Yeah, she says, no, Demira has the right to call it first. And yeah, she... And then, yeah, Demira... I think Demira kind of gets talked up a little bit by one of the other sisters to be more angsty about it. But that's just because pride or whatever. Um, Varen just makes sure that it spins in the wrong direction. I mean, it's, yeah, that's like mob mentality of, yeah, let's do it. Let's go, let's go tell Aran to shove it. <laughs> it's like, this is bad. <laughs> this was not a good move. This was never going to work on Rand, ever, in a million years. And it's based on faulty information. They think that he ordered a stabbing that he didn't order. Of course he's going to dig in his heels when he's accused of something he didn't do. Especially by implication. And, I mean, not only does he not, did he not order it, he doesn't know that she got stabbed. Like she doesn't even he doesn't even know right. that the event happened. So when they leave, he's like, "What was that all about? I don't know what's happening here." Why are you gone? Why are you back? I have no idea. Doesn't make any sense to me. And they're like, "He's so arrogant, pretending not to know what we're talking about." Yeah, and he legitimately has no idea what they're talking about. This is that situation where it's like the wheel of time. If people communicated, would be much. Shorter. I was just thinking of that meme. Yeah. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> like there is just. A uh, big miscommunication. That's all this is. That's all this chapter is, is between these two groups. Like, showing it from both the pers- their perspectives. We see it from Rand's perspective, and then we flash back to the Aes Sedai's, and we see their perspective. And all this is showing us, in minute detail, is just how much of a miscommunication this whole fucking thing is. You know what this also is showing us? Is how a bad actor can interject bad information into a situation, mm. and that's all you need to make two good actors fight each other and completely fuck everything up. Well, Aradia, how is that even relevant to real life, though? <laughs> when does that ever I happen? I can't possibly <laughs> think of an example. There's nothing that, that comes to that mind. That just came about bad to me out of out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I there's no possible examples I can think of of someone interjecting chaotic information and then just sitting back to watch it all burn. We're we're lucky that everything on the internet is true all the time. Yeah, it's all good. Mm-hmm. Specifically, my opinion is the most correct. <laughs> I mean, this podcast is technically on the internet, so <gasps> so it must be true. Dun dun dun. <laughs> I swear the three O's. Therefore, everything I say is true. <laughs> So all of this sets Rand off, back to the chapter. Well, let me rephrase that. Sets Louis Theron off, LTT, in Rand's head. And saying, I said three. And then Rand is snapping back, saying, no, I said three. And then again, this reinforces my, the fact that Louis Theron is Rand and they're the same person. This is a bad day. Rand is exhausted Uh by the end of this chapter because he's been balancing the rage of his insanity for, like, hours. To the point where Loyal has to carry him to bed. Yeah, and, like, that letter he writes to Marana, like, the handwriting changes at the end, and, like... Yeah. He is... And he's, like, speaking calmly while Luce Theron is just screaming inside him like just wordlessly screaming and rand is like calmly giving orders do you think like, that's lewis theron's handwriting those last two sentences 100 percent. Oh, oh yeah. yeah oh yeah oh yeah definitely i was hoping to you know debate about that but no everyone's just like fuck no yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. well when you when you put <laughs> it's it in like there when the smell changes to Perrin. you know it's 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 like oh no that's the Luz theron coming out <laughs> the insanity's getting at the upper hand you know rand is losing it yeah He's really losing it. So how pathetic is the Mirror of the Mists to Rand? Oh my god. <laughs> it's like... It's it's actually kind of funny because, oh I mean, god. it's like these, you know, super uber powerful Aes Sedai, and I say uber powerful, but it's like, you know, they're the embassy, and in any other realm or universe or timeline that didn't have the Dragon Reborn, you have seven Aes Sedai walking into a ruler and pulling this... Like that ruler is doing whatever you say. This is the this is the best move they have. This is the best thing they can come up with. Right, because it's not violence. Yeah. They can't actually do violence with the power. They can just right. Ample. But they can intimidate. They can yeah. Absolutely. They can intimidate all to hell. Because <laughs> in no way are they actually saying violence. Yeah, they're not saying they're going to do violence. They just this is the best intimidation tactic that they have, and it just it doesn't go well that's an understatement yeah the way that Rand just laughs at it and and shatters it and is not impressed is just like i mean even you as the reader right because you've seen moraine pull this and you've seen what rand can do and you're like this is no 
this is so small. This is just a yappy little dog shrieking at your feet. And you're just like, no. But no, think I'm back to the first time Rand has one, one of his weaves shattered by Lanfear and how startling that was. Right. Well, it kind of puts in perspective, like, the power of the Aes Sedai in this universe. They've been top of the food chain for so long. Like, they don't have any competition until all of a sudden there's competition, and the competition is way better than them. It just kind of reminds me of, like, I mean, if you're in, like, second division of a sport, and you win every game, and then you get moved to first division, and then you're like, oh, shit, we just lost every single game this season. Right, right, big fish... Or small fish in a big pond. Yeah. Syndrome. Right? Like, they they might have come in expecting this to work. And that's kind of what it seems like. And... and they pull through, right? The show must go on. They keep their choreography and their icy <laughs> ice die faces going, like, the whole way through. Because, yeah, you're right. This is very much something they know how to do. This yeah. has worked for 3,000 years to bully rulers into being impressed. Yeah. So they don't know what else to do but to finish it even though it's clearly not working. (laughs) It's like there's no pivoting, changing plans. Okay, if that didn't work, what's plan B? Like, they didn't have a plan B. Yep, we'll just continue with plan A. It's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I love how Mistress Harfor, like, ends up in between the two parties of, like, the Aes Sedai coming in and around on his throne, and then she just, like, calmly bows to both sides and, like, very calmly but very quickly just, like, walks away. Like, this is not where I need to be. I am a housekeeper. Not. Not. Whatever this is. Uh, So basically, he uses the power. He realizes he can't shield them all, because seven is probably too many. But he certainly knows where those weaves are, and he can cut them. And that takes a very little amount of power. Yeah, he just sort of flicks his finger at it and, like, ting, breaks the whole thing. And then basically he's like, yeah, no. You, not only do I, am I not giving you any more respect, but you need to respect me even more than you have been before. Because this is bullshit. I don't know why you're here. I don't know what you're doing. Get the fuck out and bow. I mean, this plan might have gone better if Rand had actually sent the Aiel to stab Demira. And then he was like, oh, this is why. Like, it may have gone better if that had actually happened. But since it didn't... It, yeah, if he had some clue. If there was some argument, over, like, yeah. he was like, oh. He's like, but no, I've done nothing but respect you, and you're coming out with me with this bullshit. Yeah, Back yeah. the fuck off, and give me even more respect, because there, you have no standing. Yeah, so it's like, may, maybe that's why it goes yeah. so... Like, he just doesn't at all, is because he doesn't actually understand why they're doing this, because they're working on misinformation, so... It's a, it's a weird take. And it does, it makes it harder for these eyes that I to sort of become close to Rand. Yeah, like really putting a wedge between you guys. I gotta wonder if Varen is trying to break it so bad so that it's like either, so he kind of has to take control of them. Does that make sense? Like, I would think so. Make it so yeah. it's not even like allies aren't possible, it's either enemies or uh, servants. Yeah. Ariel, Jen, and enemies. <laughs> nice. I mean, I, I could see it where, like, you don't want Rand to team up with either faction of Aes Sedai. That would make sense to me. You don't want him to faction up or, like, get any allies. If anything, you want both sides. Yeah. Like, Elida and the Saladar to be against them. Right, right. So break the tower and then make sure they're both against Rand so that neither yeah. one can help him. And so isolate him. So both sides are against Rand. Yeah. Right, because a united white tower might actually be able to help him. Yeah. Right, which we can't have. That would be ridiculous. Or if he throws support for one of the factions, then they might be able to, like, reform the tower because they have the backing of the Drake. Like, I, don't, I have no idea, right? But it's a possibility. Mulane's like, oh, yes, that's the right way to handle them. He must be taken by the scruff of their neck and shown the right way to act. And Bran looks at her and goes, just like wise ones? And she's like, don't be a dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Don't, don't, don't come at me. Don't, we'll, we'll slap you down. Like, that's, don't, don't be dumb about that. Come on, Rand. Yeah, I like, Rand, come on, we're talking about eyes to die, not reasonable people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's very much what she's coming from. Which, they're ivory tower idiots who have some lack of experience with the real world. Oh my god. The siloed elitism is really strong when it comes to eyes to die. And wise ones, for that matter. I mean, they're better, but... They do not like what they see of themselves in the eyes to die. No, no, they don't. Some Something I've often learned is what we hate about others most is what we see in ourselves. 
Absolutely. I mean, that's a good point because the Shido wise ones are like as bad as the Aes Sedai are because they're in a lot of ways against Rand. So if the rest of the wise ones were also against Rand, would we like them as much as we do? Or do we like them because they're on Rand's side and they're the way that they are? <laughs> uh, Rand notices that there's a bunch of undercurrents that he can't understand because he doesn't have basic facts about the stabbing. Good read. And then we get a POV switch to Min. And she has basically ran out to kind of hear everything, kind of see everything, but not really. She heard the entire conversation but wasn't able to get a clear view of any of it and reflects that even if she had, when they're channeling, it messes up the visions. Yeah, so yeah. it's questionable if she would have been able to get anything from observing anyway. So she hightails it back to the Crown of Roses, the the inn that they're staying in, and interacts with one of my favorite single-serving characters. Yeah, my hero. Because he never comes back again. We never really see him again. It's the only scene he's in. But he gets a lot of personality in this one scene. And that is Mihiro Shikosa. He's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, and he is warder to Rafella. So in theory, he is around the plot somewhere. But according to the wiki, this is the only time he shows up. I mean, it kind of puts in context of how much Aes Sedai use their warders, too. I mean, Moraine's like the mm, extreme mm-hmm. example of where she uses Lan all the time for everything, but that doesn't necessarily go like all the way through all Aes Sedai who have orders. And they don't always keep their orders with them, too, right? We see a lot of orders get sent off, and then we don't see them because they've been sent off. And in a lot of ways, Moraine is one of the few Aes Sedai who's actually been out in the world for 20 years. And so that, that would make sense that she and her warder establish a slightly different relationship. You know, there's a lot of other Aes Sedai who may be at a palace being an advisor or even like tighter leash situation right where maureen might like the fact that land goes out and does things without her express permission but i bet that there's a lot of Aes Sedai who are like no you sit you sit and stay here till i tell you to go and do something very naive attitude early on when she's like i don't need no man that's a product of being out in the world where i mean one of the first things we get about maureen land is how many times he's saved her life it's just a different dynamic and I feel like we get a little bit of that sort of borderlander relationship. The way he treats Min is the way a lot of people treated Fayil when she was growing up. Yeah, totally. Because he's a lord. So he definitely comes from the same social class as Fayil, even though Min doesn't. And so, yeah, as a sort of younger sister who occasionally needed someone to talk to and a little advice so she would not break her neck while sowing her wild oats. Also, like, get it, Candor encouraging right? <laughs> the young women to go off and sow their wild oats and maybe possibly need older brothers to keep them from getting their necks broken. <laughs> Those bells and stand for something. That's all I'm saying. Apparently. Just go ahead and ring my bell, baby. He told her she had pretty legs, would never think of touching them, and would break the neck of any man who did think of it without her permission. It's so cute! And he would break the neck of any man who thought of it without her permission. Like... Oh, I love the Borderlanders. They're so over the top with their honor code. It's pretty great. And so she plays with him a little bit. He doesn't know just how close her relationship is with Rand. He thinks she's out, like, sleeping around when she's actually just seducing Rand slowly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's like a big asterisk beside that, like, slow game there. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And so she's basically saying, like, hey, let me know, like, I don't, something's going on here, and I don't want to walk in blind. Can you give me any hints? And he works jigsaw, three-dimensional jigsaw puzzles, blacksmith puzzles. Yeah. While having this, like, game of houses-y sort of, like, game conversation with her. He's just, like, casually solving all these puzzles. I love that little, just, like, he's doing it as, like, a fidget spinner kind of thing. Because, like, I'm that kind of person. I would totally do that, and it just, it it pleases me to see a character do that, who's so memorable, right? He gets this one chapter, and he's so memorable. I mean, it's an interesting take, too, because he clearly has a few of these little blacksmith puzzles, but he does some of them because it's for memory. I think he says somewhere that, oh, I figured that one out years ago, so he, like, does that one, but when he's actually thinking about what Min says, he doesn't actually figure it out. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like little details there. It's pretty great. 
and it's such a ridiculous scene because it's sandwiched between two other scenes in a chapter in right before one of the most memorable scenes in the whole book, Blue Eyes Wells. Like it almost it, it a scene getting obscured in the light of a nuclear blast in the distance. Like it's still awesome, but that that's so that Doom Eyes Wells is so bright and so soon, it's almost hard to see the scene. And yet it's so rich. But I mean it's so important too. This this is where she literally sees Bear, uh, like Bera and Karuna talking about Rand, you know, having to be leashed, and that's what sets her to go see Rand, which sets him to leave Camelot. Like this is the scene. This is right here. It, this is the pushing of the button, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. This begins the the cascading chain reaction. But yeah, in the middle of all that, there's him being like, "Oh yeah, I am not going to bother working this jigsaw puzzle that is in my hands because I worked it years ago." And you just, like, get this whole vignette of who this character is. Even though, yeah, like you said, complete nuclear blast coming all over the everything. I think of him and Andral in sort of yes! the same thing. Yes! And Sleep. These sort of older, experienced guys who, like, know where they stand and don't really need to prove it. But still do interesting things in the background. Because what else are they going to do? Yeah, yeah. It's like your dad who's making furniture in the garage, and he's just like, oh, yeah, you know, it's just a hobby. And you're like, damn, that's professional level of furniture. <laughs> like, just a hobby my ass. Right. Like, yeah, no, but that, that is the power of the dad. There's dad power going on here. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, serious mm-hmm. dad vibes. And in men's case, it's sort of also like DILF vibes. No, I can say daddy vibes. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> can't definite, say. definite daddy vibes going on. Yeah. <laughs> She did say she liked older men, and this is the kind of guy she would have liked. Before. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, she's like, I still like this guy. I mean, when I can remember that Rand isn't the only man in the world, this guy is definitely also a dude that I'm into. <laughs> can I say how much I like that take on really? She is 100% in love with Rand, never going to cheat on him, absolutely head over heels, and yet can still be like, yeah cute i'd be into him if, like, right like hey. that that the idea that we are not a hundred percent bonded to the person that we are with and that we are allowed to be attracted to other people <gasps> it's you know the like, whole, you know just because i know what i'm gonna order off the menu doesn't mean i'm not gonna look at the other dishes on the menu i'm gonna take a look i'm still getting the same dish though R- totally totally absolutely like there is nothing wrong with looking Especially not when it's on display, like I imagine. <laughs> when they put the pictures is. on the menu, I'm gonna look at the pictures <laughs> on the menu. Like, come on. Yes, quite. Like, it would be rude not to look at this beautiful artwork. Honestly, at this point. <laughs> My headcanon is Kandori boys are extremely pretty because mm. we don't we have Narishma who's described as like too pretty for a boy. Yeah, too pretty for a boy. He's the other only other Kandori that I'm really familiar with. Yeah, then this yeah, this guy, my hero. And this guy who Min is like mm-hmm, And I mean even mm-hmm. even if the face isn't that good, the body's in shape. So I mean there's still something to be said for that. Sure. A nation of bodybuilders. <laughs> right? There's lots of like poetry, harp playing, horseback riding, like the Kandori are flamboyant, pretty athletic people. That's that's the culture. And and the horsemen too. Mm-hmm. So like and we know that um Min is a horse girl. Mm-hmm. Min is an established horse girl. So they have strong legs is what you're saying. Uh-huh. Well turned calves. One of I the think things I'm saying. Yes. yes. One of the calves. Yes, there's a lot of muscle going on in places. Yes. <laughs> a long journey, he chuckled, gently mocking. You will kidnap a husband, yet you are not careful. Not kidnapped and not married. Because those are the two most likely things to happen whenever you leave the house as a young woman. So we have Min bouncing back and forth between the palace and the inn. So she goes back to the inn after this confrontation, realizes that Bera and Karuna have shown up, and that makes 13. Because 9 plus 2 plus 2, mm-hmm. right? 2 being Baron and Alana. Alana, Alana yeah. And then Bera and then Karuna show up. So you go from 9 to 13 real fast, and she... F- basically freaks out because she knows what that means to Rand and jumps back on her horse and sprints back to the palace to warn him. It's not just what she knows. It's also the aura. The aura comes back. The aura that we know right. is for Dumai's Wells. 
like they are triggering it and part of the way that they're triggering it is because of her reaction to them but like you know causality is a tricky son of a bitch i mean that's that's the hard thing too like yeah 13 is the top number there but why isn't 11 as threatening well because 13 has like overpowered abilities true but i mean rand was thinking to himself just like two pages ago where i can handle six but i don't know if i can handle seven but add like four more and we're not worried there still well i mean he was worried but it it went from a delicate balance to a completely fucked yeah it's like okay i gotta get the hell out of here so it's the symbolism of like oh i know your laws require 13 so the fact that you have 13 is a legitimate threat that's actually a good point yeah the fact that the law is 13 so yeah it's got op powers it's got yeah the weight of law behind it and it's you know i mean min sees the viewing which rand takes more seriously than any paranoia from ltt right so let's talk about the viewing one caught min's eye when it flashed around both women at the same instant brownish yellow and deep purple bruises she says the colors mean nothing but i think she's wrong or it means nothing but it Mm -hmm. that mean nothing to her they mean nothing to her yeah she doesn't understand them i think they are talking about when those i said i are going to be beaten by the aiel wise ones oh i always figured it was them beating him but they're not part of that no but they're part of him ending up in that situation and they're gonna be there for that battle for all that blood and death they participate in demise wells yeah i can't pick us i can't pick a side on that <laughs> those are both good arguments yeah because because he they don't get beaten by the wise ones mm. some of them do for sure the the saladar no the saladar eyes to die don't it's the tower eyes to die that have to make up their toe and get beaten the other ones just have to swear fealty I mean, the Saladar became the Wise One's apprentices, and I can't believe there wasn't at least a fair amount. Well, okay, yeah. but that's like as apprentices. That's not being beaten for what they did to him. But some of the, some of them didn't take very well to the apprenticing. Well, right, but I don't see why Min's viewing would be related to their power struggles with the Eyes to Die or with the Wise Ones after Jumai's Wells. I think this has to do with the suffering that Rand is going to go through. That's true because he does get the leading uh, up to yeah. in, in that battle. He gets beaten a lot, so I mean, yeah. Probably leaning towards the Rand thing. Yeah, because these ones don't beat him. It is weird, but they also don't get beaten to the point of being dark purple and yellow, right? The eyes to die, or the wise ones are humane. Because <laughs> I'm thinking back to when she's in the White Tower and she sees the visions of the Sean Chan attack and she sees all, and, and also the rebellion, right? Yeah. All of that stuff mixed together. Like that, she sees the auras of yellow and purple and the green colors and basically the color bruises around the people who actually get beaten not around the people and like i feel like it's a very weak thing to say oh they're the cause of rand being they're not the beat er or the beat e like they're someone who may kind of cause it like that seems very Mm, weak to me yeah like they I, I feel like this is something that happens to them and the only time that they get beaten okay i can say do my as wells like maybe they are like, they get... I, I can't remember what exactly happens to them in the battle. I think they just come through it. They're kind of in parents' wake, as I recall. Right. So I would guess that this is definitely... Like, the only time I can think that they get beaten is when they are Wise One's apprentices. Well, and she does say that the colors mean nothing, but there's something else about the aura that does mean something to her. So it might be it just be that we aren't seeing the thing about it that, like, is apparent to her. And so, like, the colors that we're seeing, like, that's part of it because of what happens to them. But it's not the important part. It's just the part that we see because Robert Jordan likes to mess with our heads. Okay, yeah. No, I'm I'm thoroughly unconvinced of anything now. (laughs) I mean, that's as good as it's going to get there. I totally think that's a a valid interpretation as well. I just, I have a slightly different one. Yeah, no, I'm just unsettled now. I just don't believe anything. I'm I'm just going to hedge my bet and say it's both. It means both things. That's fair. You know what? Prophecies, they're all funky like that. (laughs) And also, damn you for not taking a side. There's lies, damn lies, and prophecies. Hey, when I agreed to come on this podcast, I never said I would take a side. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, the the only thing you had to agree to was to talk about the whole series and spoilers. (laughs) Yeah. 
So I feel like the next thing we should talk about is that Karuna and Bera both have a very antagonistic and problematic attitude towards how Rand should be handled. Mm -hmm. Because Karuna thinks that Alana should have been using the bond to control him and compel him. And that that's what she would have done. Like, well, without and question. Alana's right. Oh, yeah, no, but she, she figures it out in a few pages. But so, Karuna introduces yeah. herself by being like, I would completely be mind raping him, like, all the time. Not just once. And that's awful. It puts it in a huge perspective because the whole Alana thing with her bonding him, it's it's a weird take because she doesn't bend will like ran to her own will. But if she did, like let's say that that had have happened and it worked, would the Aes Sedai really be treating her as poorly as they do? Like we know Alana's status with Aes Sedai, basically she's at the bottom tier now because she did the whole force bonding thing and everyone thinks badly of her. But if she had have been able to control Rand and like force him to do stuff, would she still have that low status, or would they be like, "Yeah, good for you. Now we have the Dragon Reborn." Yeah, I I agree. I think that there's a strong Consi considering considering what Baron yeah Karuna are saying, like she should be bending him to our, her her will. Like it's she probably lost a lot of status for not being able to do that in their yeah. eyes. Yeah, if she could, it would be it would exonerate her and give her status. Yeah, it'd be like it, it would be a ends justifies the means situation where it's like, okay, we can be we can accept the fact that you bonded him against his will, but that got us control of the dragon. But the fact that they think that she just hasn't tried because they don't think that she tried and it didn't work. They just think she hasn't tried yet. Right. So right, like which, that's yeah. what's the other eleven I said I know that she tried and failed well i mean yeah by the end of this conversation they've been brought up to speed on that yeah but. by the end of it but like at this point when baron karuna are saying that they don't think that she's necessarily tried because from the, what they're saying they're like i would have done it first thing right they're assuming that she's trying to like respect his autonomy because he's the dragon and they're <laughs> like fuck his autonomy he's a man yeah which is like crazy because it's like they basically <laughs> you're trying to respect his autonomy after you take it away right yeah Bera and Karuna are both greens who have multiple orders mm -hmm. each so they have very strong so think about that about in context how to handle the orders. control of men Ugh. Yep. that implies that they're both super rapey towards their seven collective orders yep ew uh... and very controlling ew well and that's what I was saying is like Maureen Lan is a very unique situation just because we saw her first doesn't mean that that's how everybody is going to treat each other Ah, uh, that's a good point. Well, and Lan is a very unique man among men. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then Bera says that he should be leashed, which I'm just like, ew, go to the Sean Chan if you like leashes so much. Don't put ideas in her head. Oh my god. Uh, it's the sooner the better. Let's put him in a box and beat him into compliance. Like, are you sure you're on the right side, Bera? When you share strategies with Semarog, uh, it's like, hmm, maybe maybe not such a good idea. Yeah. When Semarog thinks that that's a good idea, maybe you're the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> Are we the baddies? No, it's everybody else who's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, Min is like, so Mahiro, I'm going to play it super casual and definitely not sneak out the back. And Mahiro's like, I'm not responding to that. <laughs> sneak out the back. And he never does because we never see him again. No, nope. I think that he completely protects her because he doesn't see how someone as vulnerable as her could possibly be a threat to his eyes to die. So there's no conflict of interest. I think that he's just, he underestimates men and protects her, which is great for her. But it's also like, actually, she can bring down all the eyes to die. Just you wait. I mean, it's one of the people who I wish I could get a more inner perspective of, too, because is it a, is it a Mahiro protecting men or is it he's not as loyal to Rafaela as you know, he might be. Oh, I never even considered loyalty. Spirit. Well, I mean, it's someone who plays, but like, yeah, he's her warder, but to what, to what end, right? Like, what does that relationship look like? We don't really get the perspective of a lot of warders. Yeah, it's true. I think he feels protective of Min and doesn't see her as a threat. And so, yes, he's loyal to his eyes to eye, but in no way sees Min as this, like, actual alley of information to the dragon reborn he just sees her as this like innocent. yeah that's what yeah, i'm saying yeah. yeah he's not trying to actively betray his eyes Sedai. he's kind of doing it by accident yeah he he doesn't see a conflict of interest in protecting men's little secrets and so she gets back to rand uh, and there's this quote it's the aura blood death the one power those two women and you all in the same place at the same time and i think that makes me 
go back to Dumai's Wells as the source of the aura. Oh, yes. Many of her viewings are ambiguous, but Dumai's Wells is definitely the focus of a lot of her viewings. Right. So, I mean, that, that really, like, blood, death, that, it's the aura, and then she puts it in context, blood, death, and the one power, and those two women and you, all in the same place at the same time. Th- that has to be Dumai's Wells. Blood, death. Rolling ring of earth and fire. Yeah, it very well could be RJ just, like, pointing arrows at the end of this book, so. That's that's kind of, I mean, we're coming up on it, right? This is 49. Real fast. It, it's six chapters away. Yeah. yeah. Right? Seth, we're coming for you. I mean, we can talk about this again, because I am pretty sure I'm coming back on the chapter right before Dumai's Wells. Yes, you are. Oh, so, nice. yeah. <laughs> let's Let's come back to this. <laughs> I, I want to point out the line here that he gives her. The last thing that Mahiro says is, you'll kidnap a husband yet if you're not careful. Oh, yeah, implying that she's going to kidnap the husband. Right. But in many ways, so they both get kidnapped together. Oh, I missed that. And they are very, very tight as a couple after they go through that together for a lot of reasons. So, you know, she kidnaps a husband in the sense that she is there with a man and goes through a kidnapping and they are very clearly spouses to each other by the end i mean that's shared trauma right like that's a thing that brings a lot of people together too Mm -hmm. that makes sense that's a real life thing and she's very like sticks to his side after dumai's wells because the world is not safe after dumai's wells no so they don't get together until the next book though correct because herod herod fell is killed in the final scene of this book and then they actually sleep together for the first time when they find out about that at the beginning of the next book. Yeah, but she's clinging to him over every other form of protection as of their rescue from Demise Wells. Right, right. I mean, they, they are basically a couple of this Yeah, point. so it's like, you know, they very much are cemented as a couple because they go through all of this trauma bonding um, that's that's going to happen. Can I just say I really hate the Rand thinks he raped men? <sighs> plot line it's one of my like least favorite it's unfortunately it's short yeah it's short so like we can gloss over it but it's so dumb and so ridiculous and does not need to be in the books cut that shit we we can rake it over the coals properly when we get there but i i will be excited too (laughs) yeah we will do that i will bring marshmallows and we'll make s'mores it'll be great i'm gonna leave that i'm gonna leave that to you guys (laughs) i'm gonna gonna (laughs) back right out of this one Perspective switch. Min gallops back to the palace. And we jump back to Rand as she gets to him. And there's Theron's freaking out. Trust me, Min. I won't hurt you. I will cut off my arm before I hurt you. (sighs) Well, that joke doesn't age well, Rand, at all. (laughs) Hey, it wasn't his whole arm. Come on. (laughs) Just the hand. But no, I mean, this is one of those many quotes that with, along with Min's viewing that you know, with Elaine, she saw a hand and a white hot iron and an axe and all that kind of stuff. Like, like Rand, and then not to mention Rand being the Fisher King, who loses a hand. Mm-hmm. Like, there's so many things. That, I mean, the speculation online was just like, Rand's going to lose his hand at some point. And like, yeah, he did. Right. Yes, like, in, in fact. And then he will hurt her after he loses a hand. Yeah. 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 He doesn't kill her, though. No, no. But well, he almost oh. kills her. Yeah. That. Yeah. His hand gets blasted off when Semarag comes onto the scene, and then when she gets the sad brace that's on him is when he almost kills Min. That's after he loses his hand. He kills her one-handed. Oh, almost kills her. One-handed. So when he says, I'll cut off my hand before I hurt you, like, he's not wrong. He will lose his hand before he hurts her. <laughs> it's it's too close. Yeah, it's too, <laughs> it's too spot on. Yeah, he gathers a large party to take with him because he doesn't want the Aes Sedai to have access to any of his allies, which is like 20 people and attendants. Well, it's really funny when he's gathering people, because he doesn't expect to gather a large party of people. Yeah, there's, this is the whole uh, Aiel sneak around behind him and gather everybody. Well, because he, he, wasn't, he wasn't specific. Yeah, they're like, what is this 50? What is this? <laughs> He said, get as many people as you want. And he's like, so you got your 20 people. And then, then there's like, yeah, I got my 500. What? <laughs> it's like, wait, what? Because he said as many as you want. He was thinking she wanted 20. That was the agreement they yeah, had. Yeah, well, that was his own yeah. <laughs> That was his own stupid fault. So Yeah, that, that's a you problem, Rand. <laughs> yeah. 
But then it might be a subconscious being like, yeah, you're leaving. Take them with you. That's a pattern thing is what that is. That's a, yes, yes, because they need them. He needs as many maidens as possible in Kyrian. Yeah, and it's silly of him to not say, bring as many as you can. Like, he should have been right. saying, max out my capacity for an Aiel guard at this point. Like, he's yeah. feeling vulnerable from channelers. He needs as big a guard as he can manage. Yeah. He should have done the time limit thing. It's like, you've got 45 minutes to collect people. Let's go. And then there's a bunch of letters that get written, which is kind of fun. Some are important. Yes, some are important. <laughs> Remember, like, saying, be careful with uh, Perrin. You don't want to get bonded. It's like, well, that's something we already thought about with Alana. That almost happened yeah, there. Yeah, Perrin dodged that bullet, like, multiple times. Mm-hmm. Like Neo, And then it fucking bonded. hit Rand. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, yeah. No, I mean, that's... how fast would Fael try to kill Alana? <laughs> it would be so bad for Parrot if she did. It would have been worse than Barreline by, like, orders of magnitude. Oh, I'm guessing Fael could have kept ways to keep him focused. Yeah. <laughs> well, what are you I'm saying? saying what it would have been a big, big scenic route distraction on their kinky side. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying she's as forward as Saldan farm girls. Hey, there you go. <laughs> However forward that happens to be, I make no judgment. I wonder, though, how much Perrin's wolf nature would have made him as resistant as a channeler to the compulsion of the bond. That's a good point. Maybe, like, 6 out of 10. At least something, right? Right. That, like, not quite domesticatedness, you know, would have made him as resistant in a different way to the usual. He, he's he got, like, the, the, the wolfy, like, the, um, what do I want to call it? Like the feralness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if I'm just making up words as I go here, but but that was the word I was thinking of was feral. Yeah, yeah. Like like the wild side, right? It's just so outside. So Rand's letters, besides the one that he sends to the Aes Sedai, he also tells Taim about the thirteen Aes Sedai here. I think, right? Yeah, and reiterates, "Do not kill them, even though they're scary as fuck. Don't kill them." I know this Min's gotten uh, gotten good with her blades. She's no longer fumbling when putting them back, so she must have been practicing. Mm-hmm. She's been practicing. <laughs> thought that was cute. Yeah, I, I like that uh, also that Sulin actually pulls off her first decent curtsy. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, I think that's showing the fact that she's kind of losing her Aielness in the servantness. That, like... She's not losing her Aielness. She's getting practiced at her servantness, and that's how you know she's been doing it for long enough. She can now curtsy smoothly... But, like, this isn't she can curtsy smoothly. This is she's surprised she didn't fall on her face while curtsying. Right? Like, she's a tiny bit farther to go. Tiny bit. But, yeah, it's uh, it's how you know that she's really starting to take this to the point of pride rather than repaying her toe. Can I can I throw a uh, Mistborn reference out here? Yeah, please. I don't know if you guys are cool with yeah. that. Min, Min is Vin. Yeah. <laughs> totally. A lot of similarities, obviously, with, like, the progression of being the not feminine or whatever you want to call it. Like, I don't know exactly the term there, but like... There was definitely an episode where Patrick and me went off. I think Patrick mostly went off about how how many similarities between men and Ben there were. Yeah, (laughs) it's it's, the same, same. same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's it's definitely in the history of contact somewhere. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very Uh, gender not conforming, badass with knives. Yeah, and it's like you can be both. You can be (laughs) the awesome kick ass warrior girl. You can be the pretty girl in the dress. Like, you don't have to not be one or the other. You can be both or whatever you want to be. So, they have a similar conflict between like being the badass what fighter versus the girl in the dress. Like, and it's like you just have to be like two on and have the dress that rips off to reveal the fighter mm-hmm. outfit underneath. Why not both? I kind of want to like, <laughs> I want something like that too. <laughs> Tearaways, <Fuck yeah>. right? <laughs> Let's do it. Totally. They're called kilts. So I, no. I love Super Skylakes. Um, right. I love Super Skylakes coinage here. Uh, Elvendretta. Yes. I mean, real question is why? Why did tearaway pants go to style? Right. <laughs> no. But yes, Bambi. Absolutely, pockets. We need real, proper, good pockets. If it doesn't have pockets, it can go to the back of the line. I want Elmandretta to have dreads. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's terrible. That's the worst <laughs> pun you've ever made. I hate that. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to hate it on the basis of how bad the pun was, regardless of if it could be a look. <laughs> Elmandretta? <laughs> Okay, 
so I'll see you guys later. I'm just going to go. I'm just going to out. Uh, Brett, thank you for selecting the longest chapter in the book and sticking with it. Right? Damn, yeah, man. That was, you really wanted to talk spoilers. There's a little bit about Gaul here. Oh, yeah, the Gaul Bane Shiad thing continues to percolate in the background, which is adorable. And also that just Rand remembers Gaul from the stone before. And Bane and Shiad. He recognizes all three of them as being from the stone. And they haven't spent much time around him or the Aiel that he's been with at all. They're still very much adjusting to what Rand did in the waste. Yes. Right? Yeah, they're almost like travelers who came back and like, whoa. Our culture's changed. Yeah. Rip Van Winkle totally. their way through their totally. own situation. And, you know, one of the things to keep an eye on is they are now experiencing the bleakness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They each have to come to terms with it. Because none of them were clan chiefs or wise ones, so they are learning for the first time what Rand revealed. Well, in fairness, Gaul has already been told he will probably be sent to become a clan chief someday, so he can handle it. Which we should hope so, yes. Yeah, that it speaks highly of him that he he probably will survive the trip. So he's logically going to come out all right. And then Bane and Shiad have pestering Gaul to keep them occupied. Well, uh, and let's be honest, women are you know stronger than men. They die. You know, there's, there's that whole like women die less often. No one really knows why. And it's like cause, cause yeah, because yeah, really because women are shit. willows rather than oaks to use other metaphors from within mm -hmm. the series. Right, right, right. <laughs> they channel the power rather than forcing it to their will. I mean, sometimes the gender essentialism is a bit much, and sometimes it does have useful lessons for us all. Bane and Shiad flicked fingers at one another before announcing they meant to accompany Fael, whereupon Gaul announced he was accompanying Perrin. <laughs> Curious what Bane and Shiad said to each other before deciding to go with Fael, but... They probably were just like, <laughs> we're still sticking with her, yeah. Right? Yeah. right? Right. And then as soon as they announce it, Gaul's like, yep, I'm gonna follow them, because I know Perrin's gonna be near Fael, so... Right, because Gaul at this point, I think, would feel conflicted if he had to choose between Perrin and Bane and Shiad. Yes. If he had to choose, he would he would be conflicted. But if they're both going in the same direction, he does not need any time to think about it. Well, he owes the life debt to Perrin from rescuing him from the cage. He says in A Memory of Light that that's why he started to follow Perrin, but it's not why he stayed. Yeah, Bane and Gaul. Yeah, it's just a matter of when that, yeah. I've always wondered when that transition is. I mean, it wouldn't be like a, it would be a slow burn, right? It would be an overtime coming to realize situation. Well, right. But I mean, like, when does that happen? Like, has that happened yet? I think so. But okay, yeah. it, we never get anything on screen that says either way. Yeah. I agree. Like, after leading the two rivers against the Trollocs, I think, like, by the time you get through that, pretty much everyone in the two rivers is like, Lord Perrin. You know, like, and I think even Gaul and Bane and Giot are like, impressed whether or not like they have the same sort of hero worship that the rest of the two rivers does they certainly have seen him step up be a leader take control save a community and are following him and and bane and Jihad have committed to Bail, his wife yeah i i agree i think that gaul followed Perrin to the two rivers kind of for the debt he owed him and then upon getting through everything it's like Oh no, you you are the battle leader for me. This is great. This is fine. You are so worth my time. Because really right here, he could make the decision to go back to the Aiel. Absolutely. At long last, right? Not until they got back to being with Rand was that even really a feasible option for the Aiel. Otherwise, they would have been cross-countrying it as just the three of them. Right. Like, not... But great. now he has a chance to make that decision. And he could be like, you know, I've saved your life multiple times. I've repaid you. You know, our, you know I have... My G is paid. My toe is paid, whatever. Right. I don't have any more toe. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. But at this point, he's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm in. in. I'm in 100%. Now I'm in because you're good to follow, not because I owe you anything. But at the same time, if Bane and Shiad were like, no, we got a dip, we're doing something else, he'd be like, sorry, Perrin, I will be back just as soon as they let me come back. Because proximity. That's a question. Would If Bane and Shiad had to dip, would he have followed them or would he have followed Perrin? Or would you have given up? I would have been like, I, that was a, I, I gave it my best. It didn't work out. Maybe I'll see them, you know, later on in the dream. You know, I'll take a, I'll take a stance here. I'm going to say that Gaul would go with Perrin. 
I mean, I understand where it's like the whole... Okay. Well, and this is the thing. So he does own the blood debt for saving his life, but I think that Gaul sees him as a powerful ally, leader, slash friend, and the whole Bane and Chiad thing is, as much as it is what he wants relationship-wise, I don't think that Gaul is done with Perrin yet. Like, I think that he still owes him. So, Brett, you're on the bros before host. I, I am, but it's like, I mean, look at look at the end of the book. Like, Gaul in Teleran Riyadh teaming up with Perrin. Yeah. Fucking like, there, there's some serious, like, you have to be bros to to say, yeah, you know what, this whole, oh, dream world thing? Okay, let's, let's do it, man. I don't know anything about it, but I'll do my very best to fight off the Forsaken in the dream world that I'm not familiar with. I just think, I, I don't think Gaul ever leaves... Perrin behind as like bros first. That's that's the stance I'm taking. Yeah, on this. I could I be mean, totally wrong, but that's what I'm gonna I do. Because I dipped but on it, I dipped on the whole like take a side last time, so I got to take a stand this time. I appreciate that. That's that's fair. I just my pushback to that is that he waits to see what they say first. But maybe it's just a matter of appearances, and he can't say anything until they've said it. Because that's just smart that's just like from a male from my perspective that's a smart move to wait to see what your wife is gonna say first and just like pray that it's gonna work out so yeah i'll buy it i'll, buy I'll, I'll, it. I'll like, bow down to your expertise i'll, I'll yeah. buy it <laughs> as the only non-married person in this conversation oh we, we have got to talk about what sulin says up here about being a sun crazed lizard because it's so funny where is it sulin vanished as well coming back with a bundle in her arms that seemed made out of red and white dresses. With her face fixed in that incongruous mildness, she growled at Rand that she had been commanded to serve him and Perrin and Fayil, and that only a sun-crazed lizard would think she could do that in Camelin when they were all in Kyrian. She even added a My Lord Dragon that sounded a curse and a curtsy, amazingly, without a single wobble. The latter seemed to amaze her, too. Now you say, did you say sun crazed or sun creased? Crazed. Okay. It's crazed. Sun crazed lizard. I assume that lizards are also sun creased, but. Uh, so a sun crazed lizard, right? A lizard who can't like get a, bury itself and so gets like cooked, basically. And it's just going <laughs> yeah. fucking nuts. A lizard yeah. going through heat fried. stroke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bra a brain fried lizard. That's a bad. Yeah. That's not a good time for the lizard. And uh, yeah, so Fayil writes a letter to her mother and her father. Rand is very confused about which one is for which, but it's really obvious. Us. Right. Brett, would you like to get that one wrong? <laughs> hey. <laughs> no, no. I'll agree with you guys. <laughs> uh, so I would assume the one that's difficult to write is the one to her mother, and the one that's easy to write is the one to her father, and Rand gets that directly, or Perrin gets that directly backwards. It's Rand's yeah. POV, but yes. Rand's POV, yes. yes. Rand gets it backwards. <laughs> they, he gets it backwards. But yeah, writing to her father's easy. Her mother, it's like... <sighs> Saldea relationships are basically backwards, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, totally. Yeah, when I say backwards, it's like backwards from what the Two Rivers boys expect. What do you think Loyal writes to Aerith, and does Aerith ever get the letter? It's a, uh, it's like a softcore, you know, porn book to Aerith, basically is what it is. I can verify that. Your ears. Yeah, talking about her ears. It's it's essentially a dirty text. It's yeah. like yeah, yeah, that's what it is. A hundred percent. Wait for me for your ears or so. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Send me a picture of your ears. <laughs> Send lobes. <laughs> Eyebrows only. <laughs> but do you think she ever gets it? Does Aerith ever come to Camelin and get this letter? God, I'm trying to keep track of where Aerith goes after this. I do not know. I'm going to Google that really quick. Do you think it's like one of those, like, it comes around a couple of years later and it's like those cringy love letters you write in high school and then you're like, <laughs> I really wish this had never seen the light of day. I would like to murder myself right now. They catch up with him in Tyr. I don't... Do you think they go back through Camelin on their way to Tyr? But, I mean, they would have to go to Camelin, right? Like, that's where they're headed because they think he's there, and they would have to leave from Camelin to go to the next place they think Rand is. Well, they're in they're in the Two Rivers right now. Because they came to Camelin, and that was where Rand picked them up. They would get the letters upon arrival, would they not? Or am I misunderstanding that? No, because they've already been to Camelin, right? That's where Rand took them to Shadar Logoth from Camelin. Okay. And then they go to the Two Rivers. 
if they just stayed there, they totally would have run into Loyal. All they had to do was not leave Camelin. Yeah. And instead, they went. To, they followed him to the Two Rivers when he so was actually when, on their way to greet when them. When did they meet up again, then? No, it's at Lord Algarin's manor. Yeah, in Tyr. That's in Tyr? That's a Tyrant yeah. property? Okay. Yep. But I have no idea how they know to go there. Learning that Loyal already left Emmonsfield, Elder Halman, Blah and Blah, Corville and Aerith travel back to Camelin and then back to Kyrian. Discouraged, they decide to return to the Great Stump at Steading Shangtai. They stop at Lord Algamar's manor on the way. <laughs> so they have to do it like Matt. They can only find Loyal when it's random. Yep. Okay, so she does get the letter. Presumably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay. Presumably, yes. She definitely oh does. Oh my god, they so she's definitely like go back carrying this letter around, being like, my husband writes the best my loyal. love letters. <laughs> my loyal. Just as soon as I can marry him, I can look at his ears. <gasps> oh, this is definitely a love letter then. 100%. Mm-hmm. Okay, oh, yeah, this is no Elaine back and forth nonsense. This is just mm-hmm. straight up the first letter. The whole. I letter. imagine it very, like, Civil War soldier- my dearest love, <laughs> I have been on the road for many months. Oh, I find God. your absence frustrating. However, I must do my duty and continue to document the way of the Dragon Reborn. Mm-hmm. And she's just like, my scholar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and oh, again, they're, they're so by the way, they're sweet. teenagers. Remember that. They are pre, they're almost like, they're what, oh, 16? Oh God, it's so cute, I can't. So there's like a cert- certain level of like angst in the letter too. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, like pent up cross lovers, <laughs> so much drama. Pent up something. That's yeah, all yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So once he crosses the gateway and closes it, anything before that? Oh no, I want to point out that he's got the that Mistress Harper got him a seal, and she gives him a very bland look when he raises an eyebrow. She's like, "What? You're the dragon. Obviously, there's a seal for you." Duh. And I love that because it's so dry. I feel like this goes back to the goldsmith who had a lot of trouble making the dragon pin for the Ashaman. Getting anyone to carve anything in the dragon seal is difficult. Mm-hmm. And she's like, you didn't ask for it, but I'm the head housekeeper. So obviously that happened. So, the, so you need a seal. But she just looks at him so blandly and doesn't say any of that. No. Because <laughs> she's Mr. Tarfor. Ah, I love Mr. Tarfor and Master Nori. They are so great. He has so much, like, Downton Energy vibes. I love it. <laughs> I, Abbey. You know, I really hope that Wheel of Time contains some Downton Abbey vibes in oh, these sort of yes. palace scenes. Yes, exactly! That There's a mix of politics and action that, that is so delicate and so hard to, to, to pull off that I really am hoping the show can nail it. And, like, it's, like, somewhere between The Witcher and Downton Abbey. Rafe Judkins, <laughs> are you listening? We've got it figured out. <laughs> That's the balance for Wheel of Time, is it's not The Witcher, and it's not Downton Abbey, but it's got aspects of both. And how the fuck do you look at those two shows and go, and smash them together? Like I'm so here I mean, for this. I think yeah. that's one of the things that Wheel of Time has on like Game of Thrones, for example, is the politics side is so more... It, it's so much more like i don't know if subtle is the right word but it's like low key whereas game of thrones was like oh political maneuvering and then boom someone dies by getting their head smashed in and then they have sex with your wife because that's what game of thrones was it, it's so like <laughs> that which admittedly is probably more true to history but <laughs> like i mean in some aspects but i think real time in a lot of ways gets it right where it's like the politics is f- fine maneuvering and it's not overt like undermine you and then boom i kill you and take your kingdom it's more like undermine and then slowly your estates whittle away until you're not relevant anymore it, it, there's so much in wheel mm-hmm. of time feels more how companies exist today yeah it's like i'm gonna fund my <laughs> fund my competition so i don't get <laughs> like a monopoly on this industry looking at you microsoft but anyways i'm just saying like there's so many different things <laughs> But yeah, then the next thing I have is Loyal having to carry Rand to bed because he's exhausted from wrestling with LTT. And that's just his, you know, he says, you know, once he learns there's 13 Aes Sedai on that side of the gateway, he goes to DEFCON, you know, yeah, one or five or one. Ten, uh, one. one. Okay. He goes to DEFCON one and like is at high alert until he steps to the gateway and closes it. And he's locked the 13 Aes Sedai on the other side of the country. Then and only then. 
is he able to relax? And he attributes that to struggling with Louis Theron. But again, Louis Theron is his insanity, which is only active because he's dealing with the stress of the 13 Aes Sedai and the high paranoia of being attacked at any time. And Louis Theron is screaming in his head, like insane, beating his head against the walls of his padded room. Trying to seize the power. Yeah. And just clawing at the walls and like having a really bad day. Like, I mean, if we're talking about Lewis Theron, if we if we want to put it in the context of mental illness, this is a bad day, and he's and he's been triggered. He's he's hit all of his triggers all at the same time. Yeah, he's like way down past the camping sporks in terms of his spoon count. Mm-hmm. Like there is nothing. He is he is in the worst pit of where his insanity goes, and he's holding it together as Randolph Thor. The Randolph Thor mask more or less has it together and on the inside he is having the bad mental health day yeah it's it's always a wonder because i mean from rand's perspective he's holding it together but what does everybody else see they see someone getting cold and hard and distant and needing the heart of stone to remember tears and the soul of fire (laughs) love and all of that he has done nothing right all he's done is gathered everyone together and opened a gateway and fled and then he collapses on the other side yeah yeah, like, he's not doing as well as he thinks he's doing in front of people. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's not. Yeah, he keeps his voice calm, but, like, he's just dead inside, and it's obvious to everyone with half a brain. Ugh. Rand. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the whole, like, unre- unreliable narrator we get all the time, where the character that we're in the head of is like, I did a really good job of this, and then everybody else are like, you did a terrible job of this. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't be suspicious. It's like, you Don't actually didn't suspicious. do good. Would you like to read the letter, Brett? I mean, I can. I've been told that I'm really bad at reading a few times. Yeah, well, you know, I've I've decided that guests have to do the readings, so <laughs> deal with it. Okay, well, okay. It's not my fault that people tell you that I suck at reading. <laughs> For someone who reads all the time. Yeah, I back him up on this. They won't, and we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible okay. at them. You know, we, we had Patrick, who was the Golden Pipes, but he's left, so now I uh, have to recruit whoever I can get. So I'm going to struggle yeah. my way through this. Okay. Moran. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Are we ready? All right. Morana. A friend of mine once told me that in most dice games, the number 13 is considered nearly as unlucky as rolling the dark one's eyes. I also think 13 is an unlucky number. I am going to Kyrian. You may follow me as you can with no more than five other sisters. That way, you will be on equal footing with the emissaries from the White Tower. I will be displeased if you try to bring more. Do not press me again. I have little trust left. Randolph Thor, the Dragon Reborn. So yeah, Moran is reading this letter, and it's written in two different hands. Yes, the last two lines almost seemed a different hand from the rest. That is the LTT talking. 100%, Hundred percent, yeah. But yeah, Marana is very cowed by this letter. She's sitting there quietly, being like, "Everything's about to fall apart, isn't it?" And then it does. So Marana goes from like doing medium to doing bad real fast. Yeah, that it, it de-escalates quickly. <laughs> like we're talking a page and a half. Like what is this? Two pages, and she goes from leading this embassy to no longer being in control. And being told to go away, and then letting they're letting her come along for the journey. Like, it goes so bad, so fast. So, it hurts. It hurts. She thinks she's being rational, and then they're like, are you done throwing a temper tantrum? Because we're moving on. You have failed. <laughs> stop. Just stop trying. You have failed completely and utterly. We are taking this from you. I mean, could you imagine, like, Baron Karuna show up and they're like, Marana is literally making the biggest dog's dinner out of this situation. We have to save it right now. And they're wrong, but, like, I can see where they're coming from. Yeah. Wrong-ish. Well, they're wrong about their ability to do better. (laughs) Right. Fair. (laughs) Not wrong about the dog's dinner part Correct. Correct. Well, and I mean, it's, if Karuna's leading this, or not Karuna, Marana, if Marana's leading this embassy, but let Demira make the decision on how to approach Rand because Varen's pushing her. That's also a bad decision from Marana to like let that happen as the leader of this embassy. She doesn't have mm-hmm. control over it, and she hasn't for a long time. A strong leadership is important, and bad leadership is also important, but in a different way. Yeah, but leadership you're 100% just... right, where it's like Ugh. Vera and Karuna are not going to do a better job of it. 
Yeah. It's a really good thing that they end up getting sort of absorbed into Perrin's party because I don't think they ever would have done well with Rand. Well, and this is the funny part. I think I mentioned this at the beginning, but every single one of these I said I minus the four that get sent away to bring the two rivers year olds to Saladar, all of them have to swear fealty to Rand after Dumai's Wells. Like every single like nine of the thirteen here. Because four yeah. of them go away and all nine have to swear. I mean, I think that might be Varen's long term uh plot. Varen knows what's gonna happen. Varen knows. <laughs> Varen knows. Or at least yeah. Varen hedges her bets really, really well. <laughs> really well. <laughs> uh, we are at the Aes Sedai sort of absorbing Rand's letter. So Karuna is like, how dare he talk to us that way? It's so impetuous. And then Bera is far more upset by the fact that Rand has clearly discovered traveling. They've now worked out that that's what's going on with him. He is more powerful even than Loghain or Mazrum Tain, yes. Yeah, that's a, such a weird line. It's so weird to me because it's so obvious. Well, yeah, it's I like know, yeah, right? the dragon, the actual dragon reborn, is more powerful than these other two bros. And it's like I get that they're not just bros; they're super powerful channelers, or whatever, whatever. But that's not the point. Are they still thinking he's a false dragon? No. Remember back in Dragon Reborn, I, I think it was Dragon Reborn, or maybe Shadow Rise. I can't remember. Anyways. Egwene and Elaine are trying to teach Rand how to channel. And Egwene has that line where she's like, hey, Rand, you're the dragon reborn. You're probably, or at least as strong as I am. And it's, it's <laughs> right. the delusion yes. of where she thinks that he's probably as strong as she is because she's had a bunch of people tell her that she's the most powerful channeler that there's been for a long time. Yeah. So it's like that sense of, sense of like, you're out of your like realm of powers here. Yeah, Rand is more powerful. It's it, the arrogance. The arrogance of Aes Sedai. How dare he talk to us? How dare he behave like he's stronger than us? Like, bitch, he's the dragon reborn. What yeah. did you expect? <laughs> yeah. He's an order of magnitude above you guys. Literally. Yeah. You need 10 to 13 of you to even shield him. That's an order of magnitude right there. Yeah. But, I mean, that's quintessential Aes Sedai. So, that kind of fits. You're not, I mean... They're and only I, a little arrogant. And, and then they're <laughs> over here sometimes. thinking, like, oh, well, should we deal with Taim? Should we deal with the Black Tower, like, on the way to deal with the Dragon Reborn? Is that something we can fit into our schedule between tacos and brunch? And it's just like... <sighs> All 13 of us? Well, let us we don't have time to get into the whole, like, let's go send the embassy to the Black Tower to go and settle them with their two <sighs> dozen Aes Sedai or whatever it was. I don't remember, but that whole sequence was a complete disaster yeah and it, it, karuna's just like no i don't think we have time and it's just like y you have so many levels of not the resources to do this it's not just time <laughs> <laughs> right yeah thank you karuna for understanding that that is slightly outside of your ability to fulfill i do not know how many sisters will be required to handle so many more than 13 yeah yeah <laughs> spoilers more than 13 <laughs> More than a thousand. More than thirteen thousand. <laughs> like, yeah, thirteen thousand might do it. Yeah, probably. Except that the, not that many women channelers exist in the world. So I'm you know. nodding. <laughs> so the two rivers guys have left, and and then there's this thing about Marana reflecting on how much she had struggled against Varen, and it was all pointless because Varen wasn't the real threat. And I'm just like, <laughs> it's because Varen's really good at hiding in plain sight. You were right to struggle against Varen. You were just incompetent to ever actually win. Well, and Varen wasn't trying to take leadership from herself. She was just trying to undermine you. I mean, right. that, that's Which, the brilliance yeah. of Varen. Is she? She's not the one who's trying to, you know, be in first place here. Mm -hmm. And like all she did was guide everything today to happen. That's really all she did. Just all. Just yeah, that's, that's she like, just literally like engineered everything. So you know, yeah. whatever. It's like no clearly deal. not a power play. <laughs> God, the more the more I read this, the more I'm like, Varen was <laughs> right. She's at least as much in control as like Ishamael, right? <laughs> totally. Oh, and then yeah, Alana's not there let's, yet. Let's let's but... take a vote and let's vote Varen into being part of the chosen. Like she deserves a spot, except for the whole betrayal thing at the very end. Honor honorable nomination. Come on, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, that's kind of. By definition, what the Chosen do, they betray the code. Like, Lanfear tried to do it, Ishamael tried to do it, like, 
Osmodian did it, Mogedian did it. Like they're all traitors. <laughs> well, they're because they're all very selfish. Yeah, yeah. True. All right, so Baron, Baron she's selfless. It. She's on the short list, at least. This is a problem. Baron is the opposite of selfish. Selfish. She is. Yeah, she is a vertebrate. Absolutely a vertebrate. <laughs> she has. She the has a backbone. <laughs> biggest spine you've ever seen. That's the worst pun of tonight. Okay, Seth, you're relieved. <laughs> Aradia, that was the worst one. I hate it. Oh, no. No. <laughs> uh, it had to happen sometime, I guess. <laughs> when you left, you were but the apprentice. Now you earned and become the master. Um, and so, yeah, this is the disintegration of the Tower Embassy, right? No longer are they sent away. Or the, sorry, the Rebel Embassy. And which kind of makes sense because, like, the... Amarlin has changed? Like, this was not sent by Egwene. Correct. They were all sent on the the Saladar Six's orders. Right. And so now that they've learned about Egwene as the new Aes Sedai, they don't really have, you know, Marana doesn't really have a source of power because who is she put in charge with? Not the Aes Sedai, not the Amarlin seat who's in charge. Mm-hmm. And then on... I mean, but that's that's also a failing of Marana because as a leader, like you got to step up here, and she's letting them walk over her because she doesn't feel like her authority was given to her by the proper source. Like I'm, like that's a Marana problem. That's not a like she's blaming it on the fact that she doesn't have the right authority behind you. But if you're gonna lead, you're gonna lead regardless of what the authority is that sent you. And that's that's the wise one lesson. Right? It, yeah. You have to stand up for your own authority. If you're not going, if you don't believe in your own opinion, no one else is going to support you. And that is definitely Marana's problem. Yeah. She goes from, she goes down really fast. Like, it, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant that. But, anyways, <laughs> I think it is fun. <laughs> I think it is really funny because Rand sent that letter to be like, hey, you can bring six people. And they immediately just don't listen to that at all. No, mm-hmm. they said nine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Marana has to, like, ask for pretty please permission, even though the letter's addressed to her. Yeah. It's like a pity you can come along. It's like when your little brother has to come and play hockey with you because right. your mom told you. So. <sighs> yeah. And, uh, th- and then there's this whole thing where Karuna, like, Alana shows up and Karuna's like, well, haven't you, like, super control him? And Alana's like, oh, didn't I tell you? Yeah, the compulsion doesn't work. I raped him for nothing. Isn't that great? And it's just really catty, and I love it. It's like, well, at least you can tell us where he is, right? And it's like, uh huh. <laughs> Fine. Well, I guess you can come. I, w- I was wondering because, like, would there be more? I-, I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, but would there be more respect if Alana could do more than nothing with Rand? Oh, I think like, so. The- I think yes. they definitely would have had an easier time holding their noses and elevating her, if so. And I think that's probably part of what Varen's thinking as she's like sitting in the background and like tilting her head and being all bird like. I think that's one of the things she's thinking about. It, and if only because she would be more useful than she is. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very pragmatic. Because to them right now, she's only she's only useful for her ability to sense her end. Yeah. How it's she all, is it's a all tool. Bad. Yeah. She will be given more or less respect depending on how useful she is, not autonomy or anything. Just respect. Just superficial respect. At least it's not based on her appearance? No, it's just based on her ability to mind control people. Woo! <laughs> this is how Grandal gets started. <laughs> mm. Ooh. You think Alana is another Grandal? I think Alana's personality could go in that direction. Yeah. She's flamboyant, she's tempestuous, and she sees men's men as a means to an end. I don't know. That's probably putting too much evilness credit on Alana. But I think she could have become a grand old acolyte in a different turning. So Marana makes an attempt to control the, the embassy, and it ends with, Are you quite finished, Bera said coolly. Oof. That's rough. That's rough. And that's when Marana shouts, because she's lost, and she just starts yelling. And they're like, Calm your titties. Unbunch your panties. <laughs> Her her whole controversial line of we need him more than he needs us. I said I need no one. They How dare don't you like say that. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even mm-hmm. if it is true, you don't say that out loud. Yeah, unspoken truths are ugly when they get spoken. And you know that it's true because you know three oaths. Well, you know that they believe it's true. Well, yeah, she believes it's true, but I mean, there is a degree of it is true. But you know, yeah, if you assume that Marana is a gray. 
and you assume that she's politically savvy and you assume that she has authority like she's speaking the truth for all of them she's speaking what none of them will admit she gets sea folk apprenticed she would have done well as an aiel apprentice but she doesn't get the chance but at some point she ends up with the sea folk but i think she must pass i think she does go with the aiel for a bit and i think that she's one of the first ones to actually start it and taking the apprenticeship from the aiel well, so Marana, after Dumai's Wells, Marana goes to the Sea Folk to negotiate for Ran because she's the Grey, so she goes that way. And then she also goes to deal with the Tear Rebellion. Oh, so that's like right after Dumai's Wells. Yeah, so after. So oh, I don't think she goes okay. to I don't think she goes to the The Wise Ones. Like the Wise Ones. Okay. I believe you because I don't remember specifically and that sounds right. <laughs> I'll take it. I don't know if it is right, but I'm like meaty. I'm like six out of ten sure. Okay. The extraordinary collection of girls from the two rivers must be taken to Saladar. You, Valandine, Karine, and Berenicia. Berenicia must assist Marana in that. So Marana is sent back. No, she's to not, because Saladar. right after that, Marana says, "But I'm a gray, and you might need me to help negotiate. So can I come with you, pretty, pretty, please?" And they're like, "Okay, you can come with us." That's like the last page. And they swap out for Jamira. Oh, yeah. Oh, I missed that. Yeah, they swap out Marana for Jamira because they still have to keep the number. Yeah. Yeah, because they I think they do try to follow Rand's order, right? They send four away. Oh, and then they take nine. Oh, no, they don't. They don't follow. They send gotcha, nine. The gotcha. four go to the to the Saladar with the girls, and then the nine of them go on. So they definitely don't listen to Rand's orders. So yeah, Demira almost goes to Dumai as Wells, and then instead gets swapped out with Marana at the last second. And then yeah, yeah Demira, goes to Demira goes to Saladar. Yeah, and then yeah, we we end the chapter with Marana just being like, oh, this was a really We'd bad day. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like, and honestly, I really like what Marana has to say, and I'd like to read read out with that last paragraph. Marana sat very still. She prayed that the Hall had chosen an Omerlin by now, someone very strong, in the power and her heart. It would take another Diane, another Ashima, to make them once more what they had been. She prayed Alana led them to Althor before he decided to acknowledge Elida. Even another Rashima would not save them then. Egwene to the rescue. Right? <laughs> She's like, oh, I hope they've picked Egwene. Basically. <laughs> She's like, please say that Egwene has been raised by now. Like, yeah, we got you. Yeah. Because it's... it's this is why i think marana is great is because she's actually buckling to the pressures of the situation and adapting and not just blindly clinging to Aes Sedai traditions she's like we need someone inventive and powerful and we need to accept that the dragon reborn needs us less than we need him and all of this like she's adapting the stubbornness does not help Ever. No, and that's why she's losing power because she's like acknowledging the reality of the situation and Ugh. i said i do not acknowledge the reality of the situation <laughs> that's true that's Everyone, a good point shit. though <laughs> yeah acknowledging reality of... is is absolutely the best way to lose power <laughs> well i mean externally yeah we're not gonna talk about all this shit that fell off my desk when i did that <laughs> beautiful chaos <laughs> yeah the lord let the lord of chaos rule I was going to say that I said I don't have problems acknowledging reality, just not out loud. And then also not internally. <laughs> so Fair. Yeah, it's all bad. I, I think it has a lot to do with the oaths. Like, if you can't tell a lie unless you believe it, it makes you lie to yourself. That's, That's true. Yeah. That's a good point. And they don't speak the lies to themselves out loud, which means that they can think lies all they want as long as it's about mm -hmm. themselves. <laughs> Are you saying there's downsides to the three oaths? That sounds <gasps> Mm. No, I would I would speak that, but then I would choke to death on the three O's, so because that would be a lie. <laughs> I just want to say thanks again, Brett, for for showing up and and recording with us. This has been really fun. Thanks for sticking with us for almost three hours of recording. Um, that was fun. Was really that great. was a good time for me. I yeah, I don't get to talk spoilers very often in depth, so I loved it. Yeah, no, it's it's got to be a relief, man. <laughs> I, I don't know how you do it. Honestly, I'm not sure how Danny does it, because, like, I would cheat if I were her. Oh, my God, right? <laughs> yeah, she's got she's got crazy self-control. Like, it's it's uh, it's an interesting thing, so. But, I mean, hey, 
Can can I have some of that self control? Does she have a little extra that I can like? Just siphon it off. You can ask. You can ask. I mean, that's <laughs> good luck. I am asking, Danny. I am asking through you, Danny. If you hear this, <laughs> when you hear this, in however many years, because clearly oh God, everyone's right. gonna binge through the whole thing years after it's been published. I mean, that's the funny thing about podcasts. I mean, if you keep it online, like she can listen to this when we're sixty years old. Who knows? My kids could listen to this when they're old enough. Okay, I'm gonna go. Yeah, this is terrible. Okay, anyways, let's. <laughs> oh, children, yeah. you have no idea what you're in for. Race <laughs> <laughs> number eight hundred seventy thousand sixty-two. Got to have children. But I'll see. I'll see you guys in like six or five chapters or something. It's pretty soon. Ah, look forward to having you back. That's gonna be great because this was really fun. Like we'll be revisiting yeah, five chapters. concepts. It'll be amazing. It'll be good. Okay. called Corinthian Rhapsody uh, what was that almost a year ago yeah I got halfway through recording uh, recording it and then kind of stalled out oh I thought you like not you didn't work on that today then no I when you wrote it originally I actually like enjoyed your writing it so much I got halfway through recording it before I stalled out <laughs> it was fun I think we got a shot at winning that sucker I'd love to, to hear you yeah, I'm not even like... talented to even like not even touching that so It'd be, it'd be... See, I'm just good enough at singing to feel really intimidated by Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just good enough to be like, I'd actually try and totally fall on my face because it's Bohemian Rhapsody. Hey, I, I can sing it in the car by myself with the windows up, but like, I'm not going to be singing that for people to hear. Mm-hmm. But I am very proud of this, and if I had any way to carry a tune, I would absolutely be singing oh, it. See, I should do it because I can carry a tune. Like, not to... Oh... We could dominate Dusty Wheel, or at least have a decent submission. <laughs> like, yeah, no, I, I really should. I just need to get over myself and do it because I can carry a tune in a bucket. Like, I could definitely give a good showing for how hilarious these lyrics are. <laughs> but and then he wants it done in a with a video too, ideally, which means that like, <laughs> ooh. ooh, I didn't think about that. Yeah. So I, I mean, guess is there a prize for this or something? Or no? There, yeah, there is. Oh, there's just is? like. Yeah, there's some secret prize that they're not revealing yet. But the top three entries are going to win okay, something. Okay, that's cool. So the lyrics have to be original, no sampled lyrics. Hmm. Oh, okay. So we're fine with background audio. Uh, 30 seconds of singing, fine. Can be an audio file. Yeah, the video is recommended. Video. <laughs> yes. And honestly, for something like this, you have to do something. No, I, th- I think just I have to shoot a video of myself doing it without getting too caught up in the theatrics and then just accept it. You do have a field that you could go shoot it in. I do actually have a field I could go shoot in. And then I could actually not have to try to shoot a video where I sing it correctly and look at the camera correctly at the same time. Because I could go running around in the field and then put the lyric over it. And I could totally, like, sing it in really, really off-key and then, like, cut that in every once in a while. Like, not actual the audio, just the video of me, like, <laughs> I will not go! Like, the, the, like, maybe I could do some of the deep, deep oh stuff. Oh, my God. Like, okay, okay, okay. okay. I, I'm saying I could have fun with this. Yeah. Uh, this is not really an optional thing, Aradia. This is this is a business venture. And, oh, is that- um, <laughs> As as your business partner, I am. I, I feel like I've done my side of the work, and I need you to step up and. <laughs> <laughs> What's the bonus pay? Yeah, five dollars. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm not sure that singing is in my contract. <laughs> uh, bonus pay is whatever you get. All rewards from the Dusty Wheel, uh, whatever that, whatever we win. It's like uh, loot, you know, when you pay a. Oh, I was gonna say I haven't told you. Um, I got invited to come on Dusty Wheel. 
uh, in February. Yeah, me and Master of the Deck, and or we're going to talk so it's something to do with like a deep dive on Obscure Eyes to Die, I think. Right on. Oh no, it's House of Malkyr Talks. Something else is with Dusty Wheel. Yeah, I so forget. You... I got invited to two different podcasts in very short order, so now I can't keep the two things straight. <laughs> Danny and I are doing a thing with the Dusty Wheel because he's doing one uh, spoiler-free episode. So we're jumping on that one. So I'm not exactly sure what we're going to talk about yet, but it's going to be something. I'm just worried I'm going to forget when all my appointments are this week has been nothing but me double booking myself and then having to be like, so that was awkward. If I just spend money on office supplies, then eventually I'll be a better person, right? That's how that works. No. If you drink this coffee, you're going to get jittery and anxious and you're going to feel sick later. My brain. Good bean juice tastes like coffee. Make me go fast. <laughs> but it's true. Jeez. It's really, really true. I've had to cut back on my coffee because my eyelids were twitching. And it makes me sad because I love drinking coffee. And, and my eyelids still twitch even though I'm drinking a lot less. It's not fair. I had to switch to black tea because the coffee was actually giving me migraines. Because I was drinking like more than a pot a day. That's, yeah, that's a lot yeah, of coffee. a lot of coffee. Yeah. Yeah. I was like making a second pot and finishing it and being like, hmm, I want some more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> were, you drink- were you drinking it from the pot or were you at least putting it in a cup? <laughs> I mean, I was putting it in a cup, but like, so the thing is like, I my the, I have a French press, but it's one of those double walled vacuum sealed French presses. Oh um, yeah, okay. And so I can make the coffee in it and it stays hot for hours. So I just put it on my desk and then pour directly from that into the mug until it's gone. Uh-huh. Which is basically like That was like a long way pot. to say that you're drinking it from the pot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <That's laughs> uh, no, no, no. See, it's different because it's it's a smaller pot. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> um, so now I just have like 6 cups of tea a day. Which is better. But it doesn't taste like chocolate. You can get chocolate tea. There's, there's flavors. Yeah, a good... The, uh, but it tastes like vanilla, right? So like a good like Earl Grey or um, English breakfast with a little bit of, of milk in it, to me, just tastes like a, a nice vanilla milkshake. Honestly, that is actually really true. Milkshake. I don't know why mm-hmm. I don't drink tea more. You gotta get on the, uh, the cinnamon honey bus, too. Mm. Sure, mm. sure. Although I'm not a big fan of the sweet. I don't put sweetness in my drinks, either coffee, or I don't oh, sugar my coffee okay. or my tea. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I think I don't get into tea, is because a lot of them really want sugar to taste better, and I'm just not into added sugar, so maybe I need to get more creative with what... I learned milk in my tea when we lived in Nova Scotia, and well, my mother learned to put milk in her tea in Nova Scotia and passed that down to me. So that is, a, as far as I'm aware, a Canadian habit. Putting milk in tea is really? Canadian? That seems like the only way to even start to approach tea. What about like the UK? Like I don't know enough about tea. Don't they put like milk or cream or uh, something? Maybe British. Or... Well, chat is saying it's a British thing or a Commonwealth thing. And like I always put milk in my tea and I'm not part of the Commonwealth. Okay, that makes sense if Canada got it from Britain with the milk thing. So, in- don't, Doesn't England add lemon? Am I making this up? I don't know. I don't know enough about tea. Yeah. I, th- honestly, probably the British are not a monolith when it comes to tea drinking habits. And Keith, I, I do, like, honey and tea is okay. It's just, I'm not a big fan of adding sugar to my diet. I don't have to. Right, right. I'm, I'm very, part of it is, like, what I'm trying to do is cut out calories and use as little, you know, tea and coffee unadulterated are basically flavored water. There's no calories involved. Oh, right, yeah. See, I put tons of milk in my coffee. Less than I used to. Mm-hmm. So I try and use just a small splash of milk is is basically and no sugar. And for me, Brett, I think you were trying to say drinking just water. Yeah, is making me feel better, and that's how this all oh, came yeah. up. Is like just water, or for me, basically black tea or or what I call black coffee. Wait, I'm, yeah, I reverse those black coffee or basically black tea, which is you know both and maybe a splash of milk. But I'm trying to like just cut my calories down and take in liquids, maybe with caffeine. No, I, that's fair. It's definitely a good place to start, right? So, Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?